you were asked a couple of questions about your ability and reasons to stay with Mr. Alexander after a couple events. One of those events was when he had sex with you while you were asleep. Remember being asked that? Yes. My question to you then is, it, was it that unconditional love that allowed you to keep being with him even after that point in time? There may have been an element of that, but it was more because at that time I was in love with him, so, and I was already familiar with him physically, emotionally, um, his personality, all that. I was familiar with him in a lot of ways, so when that happened, um, and because I was in love with him, it didn't feel like he had violated me in a big way. Like it was something that just happened not necessarily intentionally, kind of by accident, oops, let's move on and not do that again, was kind of how I looked at it. I'm trying to put myself in her shoes as to why she would be so obsessed with him. And when you think about it, when she first met him, she runs into this guy who is a motivational speaker, public speaker, um, you know, goes on behalf of the company he works for and motivates people to feel good about themselves, make money, etc. Yeah? Yeah. Um, also very charismatic, has loads of friends, has a wide social circle. She coveted that. She, she, has n she had no idea what any of that was like. She had none of that. And she saw those things and thought, hang on, I want those things as well. And she coveted it. Hello, YouTube and Odyssey. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to part 33 of our Jodie Arias, the Wicked Witch of the Weird series. Uh, this is the second day of jury questions. And also, uh, Nermi and Martinez get to follow up on those jury questions as well. So this is going to be quite an interesting day. Uh, day 28 was, wasn't it? Yeah, that was quite insightful, actually. Yeah, and day 29 is no different. Um, so, uh, yeah, the rest of the jury questions, uh, which I'm sure that there's going to be more that we've asked <laughs> <laughs> and uh then the two attorneys get to follow that up so yeah it should be an interesting day of testimony thank you to everybody who's given us such great feedback for part 32 uh, much appreciated yeah thank you everybody and what we're going to be doing um after this is after this is premiered we're going to be uh releasing all of our videos in our long form we're going to keep doing it in long form but we're going to for the people who you know perhaps don't have four hours to spare and just want to listen to it in our chunks we're going to release like our long versions aren't we yeah to kind of augment this not to replace it so don't worry we'll still do the deep dives in the long form won't we oh absolutely yeah so just our um, usual disclaimers if you're tuning in to get some sort of insight into Jodie Arias's actions mind psyche you're not going to find it this is the first time we're what we're watching each day of trial and we're documenting it we're talking about it so um if you'd like to watch this episode or this day of trial without us interrupting it with commentary then we will leave the link to eon blue threes video in the description and can we say that the quality on this is much better than the last two episodes oh yeah it's crystal it is yeah shaz also, we are not professionals, we don't say we are, we have no expert training in body language or law enforcement, we're just two ordinary people who just call what we see. Yeah, um, we just listen to the evidence, we just listen to the endless gaslighting and, you know, we already know she's lying, uh, but... Yeah, we just call it as we see it, as Shaz says. So um, sit back, relax, uh, join us as we watch, listen, and comment on day 29 of the Jodi Arias trial. You ready? Oh, yeah, let's get into it. Let's do it.
Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Arias, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. Not that she cares. Not that it means anything to her. If she were a real Mormon or had any belief in God, that oath would be sacred to her. But you're absolutely right. It means absolutely bugger all to her. I'm going to continue to ask you the questions submitted by the jury. Several times while testifying about the abuse by Travis, you have made comments like, as I understand it now, and I've come to realize. How has this realization come about? In, because about almost five years have passed, um, just the farther away I get from the situation, the more perspective I have, whereas before I constantly made excuses for him. Um, now I understand that the things that occurred were not okay. Um, and, you know, forgiving him is different from continually putting up with it. So, in hindsight, the farther away I get from the situation, the more perspective I have of those events and the abuse. Were individuals involved in helping you come to these realizations? Um, sometimes spiritual um, leaders, things like that. Um, It's mostly just reflection on the incidents. Tell us who they are and what their professions may be. Um, these were um, individuals with the church. I don't know what their professions are, so but they come to the um, come to where I live and they they counsel me spiritually, things like that. Um, Mostly, most of them are from the Mormon Church. Um, there's also a lady from the Baptist Church who continues to visit me regularly. And during these supposed meetings, I am guessing that the lights were on, but absolutely no one was home. They were giving her loads of advice, but it, she wasn't even listening to it. It was just going one ear and out the other. She didn't believe in anything that was selling her. Yeah, that, that's what I'm willing to bet. You know, just just basically went in, but made no impact. Yeah. You are recalling times of memory loss with Travis. How is it possible you remember such details from those days if you had a foggy memory? I'm sorry, can you reread that, please? And for those of you who are hard of hearing, listen! You were recalling times of memory loss with Travis. How is it possible you remember such details from those days if you had a foggy memory? The fog or the confusion only begins when he starts screaming or if there's um, a fear that maybe there's going to be tension or some kind of escalation of anger or violence. Um, and then certain incidents such as the physical pain is crystallized in my mind. Um, so that sticks. And then also there are journal entries that I've made that remind me of that day and details of that day. So. It helps me remember, oh yeah, that day I did this before I went to Travis's house. I remember it was around this time, or this day, or this day of the week. So I did review my journals constantly um, over the years, and that's given me perspective as far as, you know, things like that. So the confusion comes in when he begins to get angry. Journal entry, whatever day or date, got up, had a wash, brushed my teeth, went out. Stalked Lisa, stalked Travis, had a strawberry fra frappuccino, went for a shit, went to bed, right? Nothing about Travis's abuse, but little tiny details that re would remind her of Travis's abuse. What a load of absolute crap. Yeah, fiction. Complete fiction. Just very badly written. Is there anyone else who knows about your memory issues? Um... Well, I mean, again, I think I have a really excellent memory. Just the issue. Answer the question as stated. Oh, it's hard because I don't think I have memory issues. Seriously. All right, then that's your answer. Did Travis's roommates ever hear these altercations, to your knowledge? I'm not sure about that. I'm guessing they did. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why they pointed the finger at her. Yep, I think you could be right there. To your knowledge, did anyone else hear your altercations? Yes, they have. 
Um, that would be Dan Freeman heard the last tail end of the altercation the morning we went to have soup pie. He came into the bedroom as Travis was storming out of the bedroom. Um, so there was that, and then also in the car, um, we had pulled over, and it was actually so I could use the bathroom um, in the forest rather than take pictures. But um, that led to an argument. When I came back to the car, he had locked me out. <clears throat> Travis locked me out, so he saw that. I just went and sat by the side of the road and waited for him to open the door, and he lost patience, and he came out of the car, and I came back in, but it led to an argument over that. Um, so Dan and Desiree were witness to that. Um, I don't know if they saw any other arguments, and I don't think anyone else that, to my knowledge, would have seen any. Just following on from that last bit, I'm very surprised that the state hasn't subpoenaed Travis's roommates to ask them about any arguments that they might have heard between him and Jody, because that would have basically disproved her victimhood thing straight away, wouldn't it? Yeah, considering uh, some of the conversations they had. Yeah. Um, and the arguments. I mean, I know that, you know, they subpoenaed Lisa, uh, Mimi, but his roommates could have offered far more perspective as to the screaming matches that went on between them both and possibly Jody's encouragement or involvement in both, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it just struck me as weird that we, we haven't heard from them. You have testified about several incidents where Travis was physical to you. Were you ever physical to Travis besides when you killed him? Forty-five trips around the marshmallow garden later. I think when he was choking me, my hands were free, it was over my torso, my arms were free, so I may have tried to push him off or I didn't want to injure him, I just wanted him to get off of me, but that was very quick and it didn't last long. Would you consider the event when Travis choked you a stressful event? Certainly, yes. You don't scare me! Ah! If yes, why do you recall the event so clearly? I recall up to the point where he was choking me and passing out. Um, I had disorientation after I woke up. Um, I had to get my bearings. I wasn't sure where I was. Um, then I recognized Travis's bedroom. I was laying on my side coughing, and so I saw the yeah, carpet. How, she how she's able to relate it today. She's explaining it, Your Honor. Overall, you may continue. Yeah, I'm just saying. Um, so I was experiencing disorientation. I wasn't thinking, gosh, Travis just choked me out. I was actually a thought sort of wandered through my mind. I said, where's Napoleon in my head? That was my thought. So it didn't really have any relation to the event. That was just a thought. I was kind of getting my bearings. Um, so there is, it's not completely clear. I just remember he had his hands around my neck and he was banging my head on the carpet. And I tried to push him off and it was, then I, I blacked out really shortly after that. Now we definitely know she's been watching Fatal Attraction too much. Yeah, it probably gave her a few ideas as well. Yeah, and turned her into a fully-fledged bunny boiler. In the moments of stress or fog, how do you recall what happened in those moments if it affects your memory? I don't recall clearly what happens in those moments um, as far as details, every detail. I just, sometimes I have a general sense of what's going on and sometimes I don't. But as far as the fog goes, it's more, again, just words that are being spoken or screamed or yelled and that sort, processing that sort of thing. Um, physical things I can remember because I, I feel them physically. Um, I can remember what I feel internally and emotionally as well, but it's more the the words that are being spoken and their meanings, but it's, I do remember what I feel. That makes sense. It doesn't. Why were you afraid of the consequences if you killed Travis in self-defense? I was, I believed that it's not okay in any circumstance to take someone's life, even if you're defending your own life. That's how I believed it. So I never really stopped to consider how society would view it if someone is defending themselves. I just 
felt like I had done something wrong and I was afraid of what the consequences would be. That, I think, is the most obvious question that you should ask, really, isn't it? Well, absolutely. If it is self-defence, why didn't you go straight to the police and say, he was trying to kill me, I, I, I killed him out of self-defence? If she killed him in self-defence, then why didn't she even ring an ambulance yeah. and, t and tell them and then the police and say, I've done this but and I've killed someone in self-defence? She didn't do anything of that. Because there were 27 stab wounds to Travis's body, a slice wound to the throat and a gunshot to the top of his head that went down into his face. That's why she didn't call the police, because she knew there was no way this would fly as self-defence. Not with 27 stab wounds. No, I mean, if you attack someone in self-defence when you're defending your own life, then you basically stab them once or twice and that's it. You get the hell out of there. Yeah, and most of the time it isn't to kill them, it's just to stop them doing what they're doing. Exactly. So 27 stab wounds for self-defence is definitely ex excessive and that is why she didn't call the police. She is talking crap once again. What happened to the gas cans after the road trip in June of 2008? They went back to my grandmother's house, um, where I went back to eventually, and um, I was taking a road trip to Monterey and had intended to bring them to Daryl, but I never made it to that road trip. Regarding shaking memory foggy reaction, number one, if you do you always have a reaction as you described when someone corrects or challenges you? I do now. I've gotten a little bit better and a little bit stronger. It's a condition that started again in November 2007 and continued. It continues to this day, but I've gotten a little better about it. You see, double standards yet again. Yeah, she loves to correct other people, but doesn't like being corrected herself. Yeah, complete narcissistic hypocrite. Number two, is this the same reaction you have when someone yells or raises their voice at you? Nine hundred and ninety-nine strawberry frappuccinos later. Yes. For the most part. Sometimes someone might yell and it, it's done and over with and it doesn't make me shake, but um, the majority of the time it does. Number three, have you ever had any situations where you have raised your voice? Now if she was to tell the truth there we'd be here for bloody ages, wouldn't we? Yes. Um, Probably a million times. There you, go. <coughs> you mentioned the pain of sex is one of the reasons you brought KY into the relationship. What are the other reasons? Um, well, for example, on direct, I just I think I mentioned that it um, it facilitates our activities a little bit better. Um, it makes them more enjoyable and, of course, less painful. During these altercations, why didn't you just scream in hopes that someone would hear you and help you? I did scream. I wasn't thinking of somebody helping me. Um, for example, I screamed when he threw me on the floor and started kicking me. Well, boo. Fucking who? Um, I was unable to scream when he had his hands around my windpipes. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I was screaming on June 4th. I'm not. I'm handing you Exhibit 164. What was the date and time stamped on Exhibit 164? 1.42 and 53 seconds p.m. And the date? I'm sorry, it was 6408. If you were scared of what Travis was capable of doing, why would you ever let him tie you up? 
When that occurred, he was um, in a very good mood, and he wasn't displaying any signs of agitation. Um, and that was the Travis that I liked and was not afraid of. Um, the moment he began to get angry, my warning bells started to go off, and I began to be, get cautious, for lack of a better term. But he hadn't displayed any of that. We just woke up. We were getting along. So, and again, they were um, they were loose enough to wiggle out of. So, I wasn't like stuck there at his mercy, so to speak. What was Travis tied up at any point on June 4, 2008? No. I don't even want to speculate whether being tied up was Travis's thing because that was Travis's thing and, and his thing alone. But it would be interesting to speculate whether Jody tried to persuade him to be tied up that day. So that, I think that's a good question. It might have been an easier way for her to carry out what she was going to do yeah, if exactly. he was tied up. She could have tied him up and basically held him at knife point and you know, threatened him. But there was no rope, so that's why this didn't happen. Yeah, but then again, if the rope had nothing to do with the murder and had nothing incriminating on it, why get rid of it? Yeah, exactly. She said that she threw it in a dumpster, but, the, but let's face it, there was no rope. She's talking crap once more. There is no spoon. Do you recall the injuries on Travis's body at any point during June 4 without the aid of photographs? No, I didn't even realize that I shot him. Yes, I said bollocks. You mentioned that one of the reasons you chose not to write negative things in your journal was because you were concerned that Travis would read it. Is that correct? That's correct. After October, I didn't write anything else negative. Um, he found it. Um, this would be late October, early November, and said that's not in line with the secret, the secret being the law of attraction, and um, made me tear it out. So at that point, I was into the law of attraction. I agreed with him. I figured he's right. And honestly, I felt really bad because that's the first time he'd ever heard me say something write something negative about him. I'd never said negative things toward him or about him. Um, I always edified him positively, positively behind his back. And um, he, I felt like, kind of like I'd been caught saying something very bad about him. So I didn't do that anymore. Do you know something? What? I'm surprised certain members of that jury didn't find her guilty just for her use of the word edify alone. <laughs> Probably they did, you never know. Probably that was one of the reasons, I think. <laughs> yeah, probably. It won't surprise me in the slightest, considering all the crap she's come out oh, with. Oh, God, yeah, she just uses it all the time. Just shut up saying edify. We, look, we know that you know what it, you think it means. Don't subject the rest of us to such bollocks. <laughs> if that is the case, why were you okay with leaving an entry in your journal that talked about how Travis would get angry if he knew you had gone to Rachel's house. That would have been in late August or early September that I wrote that, and this argument that occurred would be late October, and the subsequent um, lecturing of writing negative things occurred after that, maybe later in October, late, late, or early November. Now, we know people are different, um, and everybody reacts differently to different situations, but... Let's say you kept a journal and I looked in it. Would you be pissed off at me? Well, yeah, I would because those are my private thoughts. Right. That notwithstanding, if I looked in it and objected to something that you'd written, you would be even more pissed off, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, I'd be saying, what the hell's it got to do with you, what I write? Yeah. Basically, she lacked... Well, she was obsessed with him, we know. But as far as this jury is concerned, she lacked the backbone to turn around and say to Travis, this is my journal, right? It's my journal, it's not yours. I'll put what I want in it. Go and keep your own journal and, you know, worry about your own journal. Stop worrying about mine. Let me worry about mine, right? She didn't say that as far as, far as this jury is concerned, right? So will that win her any brownie points or credibility with them? 
No. Exactly, because like everything else she said, this does not make sense. No, it doesn't. I mean, why would Travis want to read her journal unless she told him to? Yeah. I mean, it might be a Mormon thing. We don't know. It might be a Mormon thing that you, your journals are open to other people. If that is the case, then there's something wrong there. Yeah, there is, definitely. Everybody needs their own space, whether it's, you know, a physical space or a space where you can vent your feelings, be it, you know, on a video or writing it down or recording yeah. it. You know, everybody needs that space. Why was it okay to write about how Travis made you both sick and happy or sad and miserable or that something wasn't right about him? That was a very mild way of, of how I sometimes felt about that darker side of him um, as far as sick or miserable, um, as far as just the emotional turmoil and the um, pedophilia. And so... That was also a side of him that, again, he was trying to overcome and eradicate. So at the same time, he had beautiful sides to him. So what I was doing in that is I was listing the contrast of the range of emotions that I felt when I was with him. Ain't nobody got time for that. After you snatched the gun off the shelf, did you do anything to the gun, such as cock it, slip off the safety, manipulate a slide, or anything prior to it going off? I don't even think I would know how to do that. So the answer is, I don't know. Now, we've been informed by several responsible firearm-owning subscribers and viewers of ours that it is commonplace to keep a loaded handgun or weapon in somewhere that is locked away safe. Um, but it is common to keep the safety on um, so that if anybody did pick it up and try to pull the trigger straight away, they couldn't. Now, is she telling us that um, Travis had a fully loaded, cocked and locked handgun or pistol or, or revolver, whatever, in his closet that, that you could just open the door and get it? I don't think so, somehow. No, if he had something like that, it would be locked away in a safe place. Yeah. And also, you wouldn't really tell someone where a gun is. No. I mean, that's the most stupid thing you can do. But she would have had to have pulled that hammer back for that gun to go off. Yeah, or or at least cocked it. Yeah, or took the safety off or something. Because remember, it, it, it wasn't a very powerful calibre bullet and it wasn't a very powerful handgun that she used. So, you know, it wouldn't really have killed him straight away. She would have needed to pop at him a few times to, you know, really kill him, but... I don't believe Travis ever even owned a gun. In fact, I have seen a picture of Travis holding a gun, but it was a paintball gun. I don't think he even owned a gun. To be he honest. didn't. No. It was the gun she stole from yeah, a grandfather. It, it was. She's gaslighting the jury. She's gaslighting us. We say, we've said this hundred times. We know we're repeating ourselves, but we can't repeat it enough because she keeps gaslighting us and we've just got to, you know, step up and just say this is crap. Well, yeah, because it is. Yeah. Probably not. I just grabbed it and pointed it, is what I remember. Had you ever had any firearms training or fired a twenty-five caliber pistol prior to this event? Um, never fired a gun, but I was relatively familiar with them. Not formally trained, but relatively familiar. Just, I don't know, not formally trained. Rubbish. As soon as she got that gun from her grandparents, she went somewhere secluded and she started target practicing. That's yeah. what she was doing. Probably shooting a few beer bottles. Yeah, so that's bollocks. How far away from you was Travis when the gun went off? Not when he lunged, but when the gun went off. The lunging and the gun going off was sort of contemporaneous. Shut the f*** up. I don't remember how close they were or if they happened exactly at the same moment or one right after the other. It all happened very fast and it all seemed to happen all at once. And I would say as far as distance... It's funny how some distance... Ah! Maybe as far as Mr. Babak is, but... I couldn't say for sure, perhaps with certain certainty. 
You stated that you remember throwing the gun into the desert, but do you remember what happened to the box it was in? No, I do not. What about the holster you mentioned? I only saw the holster before I moved. I didn't see it again after that. Did he keep extra ammunition with the gun? I never saw ammunition next to the gun, and I never found any in the house when I was cleaning. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't be laughing, but a gun, a loaded gun with no ammunition. How can you have a loaded gun with no ammunition? <laughs> so he only had the ammunition that was in the gun and there was no other ammunition. Sorry, this. I'm sorry, this is just getting funny now. <laughs> if Travis lunged at you, why didn't you just move to the side out of his way. Several pints of snotty tears later. Well, I, it happened very fast. I didn't have time to think. Um, everything just happened, it seemed, in a split second. So, mm -hmm. I really don't, I just didn't have time to think. Move this way or that way or back up or do this or that. It just happened the way it happened without really thinking about the best move to make. Every move you, make. you remember dropping the knife and screaming, but you don't remember taking the gun or rope with you. Is that correct? In a sense, that's correct. I remember that, uh, dropping the knife and screaming and and that memory came much later. It's actually the start. I'm sorry. No. Can Overall, I start? Overall. Okay. May continue. Um, but it goes blank after that. I don't remember putting the gun in the car. I don't remember putting the rope in the car. But I have not crystal clear, but pretty, pretty solid memories of disposing of those things. So they w did go in the car, obviously, but I don't remember placing them in the car. You are stating you believe you stabbed Travis based on logic. How do you explain the blood on your hands and clothes and the bloody palm print on the wall? Gee, let me think. Well, I do know that we struggled that day. And, I mean, based on logic, it would have been because of how we fought. I don't know how things ended up, where they ended up. I just know that we were fighting physically. If you were kneeling when you dropped the camera, how did it roll as far as it did? Can't remember if we've talked about this, but let's take her at her word. She's, let's give her the benefit of the doubt and say she's five foot six at the most. I, I do believe that her height has been stated in this trial, but I can't remember what it is. But let's say it's five foot six, right? She's kneeling and she's holding the camera and she drops it. That camera is going to drop what? At the most two feet, isn't it? Yeah, it's not going to drop as if it would break. It's not going to drop from like a standing height. If she's kneeling down, you know, and she drops it. It's going to be two foot at the most it's going to drop. Yeah, it's a lower height. It's not going to roll that amount from dropping unless she threw it. If yeah. She, if she is kneeling down and she got up and she threw it, then it would have landed where it probably would have landed. Or maybe just let go of it and brought her arm back, whatever. But there is no way she could have just dropped it like straight down and it rolled like that from two foot no way no cameras don't do that no they don't they're not blue they're not cylindrical they're not round either no they're not it didn't really roll very far it just kind of gave a bounce or two and maybe rolled like right here it didn't roll very far was travis sitting down when you dropped the camera yes he was i think so how did travis's anger escalate after you shot him He, I don't remember the words he was saying, but he 
was angrier. He was screaming more. He was cursing more. Um, and we had fallen over right after that shot occurred. And he was grabbing at my clothes and grabbing at me. And again, as soon as I broke away, he threatened my life. So that was definitely an escalation in his anger. That's how I interpreted it. Was he chasing you after you shot him in the head? Right after the shot occurred, um, we had fallen over um, in the bathroom, again toward the sink, bath, um, the sink and garbage can area, kind of in the corner. So he didn't chase me in that moment, but that's where we struggled on the floor. And again, as soon as I broke away and he said, effing kill you, bitch. Um, I don't remember a lot after that. So whether he chased me or not, I couldn't say. When you purchased gas at the Arco in Pasadena, why didn't you just fill everything up at the pump so that it was all under one transaction? Why do three separate transactions? Well, what I do recall is when I filled the gas cans, rather than have just a loose gas hose somewhere, I didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, so I hung it up, and when I hung it up, that that ends the transaction. So that's probably why, if I could have, you know, put them back in the trunk or wherever, and then started the car, or vice versa. Um, at one point, I didn't want to just set it on the ground, so I hung it up. I know that ended the transaction. Um, so that's probably why there was more than one, and maybe I was topping off the gas tank for another. Right, common sense one hundred and one. So you get out of the car, you undo your petrol cap, you take the gas cans out, you undo the caps on those, you take the petrol hose, you fill the gas can one up, gas can two up, and your petrol hose, and then you return it. And then you put all the tops on everything, screw the uh, petrol cap back on, go in and pay. Simple. That's yeah. how you do it. That's how anyone would, with any common sense would do it. Yeah, but we're talking about Jody here. Yeah. And she ain't got no common sense. So rather than like do it all in one fell swoop, she does like, what, four separate transactions? Yeah. She isn't very bright, is she? <laughs> Come on, she got caught, didn't she? <laughs> Red-handed, literally. During your testimony about the abuse by Travis, you have made several comments like, as I understand it now or I've come to realize when discussing events that you may not have classified as abuse then, but see it as such now. Have you utilized professional help? I have not had access to professional help. No, I haven't utilized that. Well, even if she did, it would be pointless, wouldn't it? Yeah, because she's a psychopath, and psychopaths don't listen to professionals, and they don't want help. No, they don't, and they'll never change. And especially that, and being a narcissist as well, um, she probably would be interested in treatment if it was all centred on her. Group therapy wouldn't suit her, wouldn't it? Would it? Because the light wouldn't be shined on her. No, it would be on everyone. Yeah. And she wouldn't like that. Um, she would probably want the praise. She would probably go through the motions of, um, you know, improving in therapy, but that's all it would be, going through the motions. All she would want is praise. She wouldn't learn from it. No, she wouldn't want to get better. All she would want is to demonstrate that she's a good actress, and if she's able to convince her therapist, she will get praise, and that's what she craves. That's what it would be. That's 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 the only reason that she would ever consider going in for therapy, I think. Yeah, exactly. Did you enjoy having sex with Travis? For the most part, yes, I did, very much. Did he force you to do things you didn't want to do? There were things I was uncomfortable with. Um, I didn't feel altogether forced. Um, I went along with it. So I didn't, he didn't physically force me or anything like that. Why did you wait for so long to tell the truth? We're still waiting, aren't we? We're waiting. Again, it took it took a long time. Um, it took a long time for me to get to this point. I never wanted to admit to this, and I had written out all my suicide letters. I sent my note. I sent them all in an envelope to my grandmother's. Do not open until 
November 10th, 2008. I was hoping to be dead by then. I was like giving myself a little time to get my affairs in order. That date rolled by, and then more time rolled by, and I, I'm, I was still here. So with the evolution of just time and the years, a couple of years that went by, it was a gradual process, and I began to feel not right about keeping it in instead. So now she's lying about telling the truth. <laughs> this case is just so weird. Yeah, but the thing is, Jodie wouldn't know the truth if, if she jumped up and slapped her in the face. Only her interpretation of the truth. You, you see now, we didn't know, like we said, we've not watched any of this trial, but I think that our choice of calling this series The Wicked Witch of the Weird was quite apt. Do you? Absolutely. All that blah, blah, blah crap that she's just said notwithstanding um she said to get her affairs in order exactly what affairs are we talking about here is it like to leave her stocks of ky jelly to matt and bobby or something i don't know i don't know i mean she didn't really i mean i think all she really had to bleed and do was a job all she had to do was to say she won't be in because she's going to kill herself. Let's face it, she had no affairs, did she? Unless it was with married men. Well, yeah, obviously. How many times did you try to kill yourself? Never, 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 never. I believe that was in California when I took apart my razor. Um, and was going to do that. That was the only serious attempt I made. Other than that, it's just like ideation. Bruh. Thinking how I might be able to do this or that. Things like that. Would you decide to tell the truth if you never got arrested? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. You said that one of your worst fears was for everyone to find out what was going on in your relationship. So why did you talk to 48 Hours and other TV stations? My attempt to talk to them was to present a better image of our relationship and downplay the negative aspects as not really a big deal, it wasn't that bad, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, I knew that he did that, but that wasn't a big deal. Um, even our arguments. Oh, sure, it was, there was turmoil, there were, it was rocky, but we were friends. So my attempt was more to present a, a good image of Travis and a good image of myself and that our relationship had its ups and downs, but we were still um, on good terms. There's only really one other TV interview I can compare hers to with, uh, with 48 Hours, and that's Prince Andrew's. Because neither interview did the interviewee any favours, did they? No, it didn't. I mean, it just made them look worse. I mean, Prince Andrew came off looking even more creepy than he is, and Jodie Arias came out looking even more callous, unfeeling, and, um, well, wicked than, you know, people th thought she was. So, you she know... Didn't, she didn't do herself any favours. Not at all. Not at all with that 48 hours interview. And as for saying no jury will convict me, I mean, how arrogant is that? A man lost his life due to this woman and she sat there smiling on a TV programme saying no jury will ever convict me when she killed him so horribly, you know? Yeah, and then she goes and leaves him a bloody voicemail. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you know, in later years, Charles Manson developed kind of a cult following. Um... But I doubt Jodie Arias will, apart from, you know, people who have some serious dogs barking in their heads or, you know, don't know any better, frankly. But if she ever becomes a cult figure, then it just goes to show you how sick society is becoming, really, doesn't it? Absolutely, Lutla. You stated in the interview with Detective Flores that Travis liked to shave the old-fashioned way. This would normally include use of a traditional straight razor. Did Travis own or use a straight razor? Okay, this is a question I asked, so I will be very interested to hear this answer. Yeah. I don't think he did. When I said traditional way, I'm not overly familiar with the process of how men shave their faces. I just know that 
he really got into it. So I think he used something that would be like a BIC, actually. Like a what? A BIC, BIC razor. In testimony on March 5, 2013, you mentioned filling a third gas can. When and where did you get this can? Can you reread that? I'm sorry. In testimony on March 5, 2013, you mentioned filling a third gas can. When and where did you get this can? March 5? I believe that was, um, that was a hypothetical. Oh, no, it wasn't. I didn't get, I had a third can when I originally purchased one in Salinas. I returned it before leaving Salinas. Um, so what we were doing is throwing out a hypothetical as to why would I only put two gallons in a third tank. Our third can. So that was a hypothetical. I only had two gas cans with me. Bullshit! Why didn't you just run out of the house instead of grabbing the gun from the closet? Well, again, I can't. It happened so fast. Um, right, okay. Every time she says it happened so fast, that translates as I haven't got a good excuse to come up with for that. Yeah, that's true. She hasn't. Yeah, because she's just got nothing, has she? No, I mean, she's trying to think of answers, but whatever she comes up with, they, all, they know all, it's crap. Yeah, all she can say was, oh, oh, it all happened so fast. Yeah, bollocks, love. I did initially think run, so that's why I went down the hallway. And then right as I got to the hallway with the doors being shut, it just seemed like more of an obstacle. It would give him more time to catch up to open the door this way and run around it and out when this door was in equal distance and open and I could just run that way and into it. So my thought maybe initially was to run out the other door and then around and out, but just something to create more distance because last time I'd run that same route, I was not successful in running out of the room. We've said it before and we'll say it again, fight or flight. You said when the gun went off, you weren't sure if you shot Travis. So when you came out of the fog on your way to Utah, why didn't you call 911 to help Travis? When I sort of came out of the fog, I realized, oh crap, something bad had happened. And I was scared to call any authority at that point. Stick it up your ass. All right, counsel, please approach. There are some additional questions from the jury. Ah, so are these additional questions that they have got while she's been answering their questions, I wonder? I guess they are. Well, yeah, because otherwise they would have been included in the first round. Yeah, that's true. When, when they were first going through them. Makes sense to cover them all in one fell swoop, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So these must have been, the, these must have been recently added. Yeah, reckon so. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that you go back to the jury room for approximately five minutes, and then we will bring you back. Please remember the admonition. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Why would you hypothesize about filling a third gas can? I was just answering the question I was asked, so I don't know why there was a hypothesis there. You stated today that you did not have professional help when dealing with your issues, yet yesterday you mentioned talking to a psychiatrist to deal with Travis's possible child porn issues. Can you explain? Can you read that last part again, or you can read the whole thing if you want. Thank you. You stated today that you did not have professional help when dealing with your issues, yet yesterday you mentioned talking to a psychiatrist to deal with Travis's possible child porn issues. Can you explain? Yes. Um, it was actually, I believe, a psychologist, and it wasn't to deal with the issues. That wasn't for professional help. That was for an evaluation of me, not counseling of any kind. 
Uh, here we go, splitting as it wasn't a psychiatrist, it was a psychologist, and it wasn't for uh, professional help, it was for an evaluation, it was still an examination, wasn't it? Of course it was, and it, and it falls under the same category, bloody psychiatrist, psychologist, well, whatever. It was still, I'm presuming, to assess her mental state, either her mental state now or her mental state at the time of the murder. Yeah, probably. So it may not have been for professional help because, as we said before, there's no way she would seek that. Maybe she would have court-ordered professional therapy, but I don't think that happened, do you? No, I've not heard anything about that. No, me neither. You say you waited two years to tell the truth because you were ashamed. Does that mean you are no longer ashamed? No, that doesn't. I'm still very deeply ashamed. It simply means that it became more difficult to deal with holding it in because, like I said, the feeling of being fraudulent is was so great, I couldn't hold it in any longer. You really make me sick with your fraudulent behavior. Did you look into the possibility of renting a GPS system along with a rental car? I believe it was offered. They're, di- they're typically offered when I've rented cars in the past, um, but it costs more, and I was trying to save money. So, no, I, I didn't. Get cheap bastard. In the story of a man and woman attacking Travis, you mentioned talking to him. Also mentioned was Travis being on all fours. Do you, in fact, recall him doing any of those things? I do recall him screaming and yelling at me, Um, so I don't know if that constitutes his talking, but he was saying words. Um, The other things, I don't recall as far as being on all fours. I don't. Of course not. You claim that everything happened so fast and you didn't have time to think, so how could you think of grabbing the gun from the closet? I don't know. What I should have said is I didn't really have time to reflect on what I should do or what I shouldn't do or what would the consequence be if I did this, X, Y, or Z. So everything happened really fast and I didn't give give it any forethought. I just reacted and did that very quickly. How can you say that you don't have memory issues when you can't remember how you stabbed him so many times and slashed his throat? Well, I, I think that I have a good memory, and June 4th is an anomaly for me. Um, Do you remember how frustrated I got um, last video with her? Yeah. This video, she's actually making me laugh because she's... She's digging herself in deeper. She's digging a deep hole for herself, and whatever explanation she's coming out with just is not convincing. Yeah, and she's also trying to backpedal as well on some of them now. I mean, June the 4th was an anomaly for me. Of course it was. Of course it's easier for for you to say you don't remember rather than actually go through why you took such glee in stabbing him so many times. And I guess she did take glee in it, because all of her rage was directed at him then, and I'm guessing that she did it with a big old smile on her face. She did. It's like I said yesterday, it's in a class of its own, and I can't explain why, what kind of state of mind I was in. Um, it was, a, the most of the day was an entire blank, and little pieces have come back, but not very many. So I can't explain that day alone, but if you were to put that day over here, all the other days of my life, I don't think I have memory issues that are any different from another average person. Did Mr. Martinez cause you to shake during his questioning? Yes. If so, can you please provide an estimate of how many times this happened during the current trial? During the current trial, it happened It happened on the day of opening statements. Um, I remember that. It happened 
almost every day. It was most intense uh, on the first day of cross. It would be interesting to know if after saying this anybody actually did go back and notice if she shook while being questioned by Martinez. I saw no evidence of her shaking whatsoever. Did you? No, she was being more evasive, if you ask me, so, when Martinez was um, questioning her. When he finally broke her on day 25, you know, that was when he broke her. But up till then, she was kind of being almost smarmy when she was answering him. There was lots of duper's delight, lots of little smiles. She thought she was getting the better of him. Yeah, but then she says that she starts shaking when yeah. he, it, the cross-examine was pretty tense. Did she expect him to treat her with kid gloves? Yes, exactly. Did she really think that he was going to go easy on her? You know, after what she did to Travis, the, the, the inhuman way with which she dispatched him from this world. Exactly. He wasn't going to go easy on her. And, and Flores told her that Martinez was a pit bull and that he was very, very good. And obviously over like the four years she was in jail awaiting trial, she got to know him a bit better. So she should have known what was in store for her. Exactly. She should have prepared. Yeah. Um, so I, I certainly saw no evidence of a shaking at all. None. No. After all the lies you have told, why should we believe you now? Oh, oh. Here I come. Oh, here I come. Oh. Lying is, isn't typically something I just do. <laughs> I'm not going to say that I've never told a lie in my life before this incident, but the lies that I've told in this case are can be tied directly back to either protecting Travis's reputation or my involvement in his death in any way because I was very ashamed of the death and also I wanted to edify Travis in a good way. I didn't want to de-edify him or say hateful things about him, especially now that he had passed away. And I also didn't want that to be construed as motive, for example, if he was violent with me. What happened to the suicide letters you wrote to your grandmother? I mailed them to my grandmother and I asked her to hold them. How could you kiss another man when you knew what you just did to Travis? You dirty bitch! Again, my state of mind wasn't right at that time. This was just hours afterward. And one of the reasons I went to Utah is because it was expected of me. And I thought by not showing up, it would look even more suspicious. And when I got there, Ryan and I had talked extensively about things we might do when we get there, including being romantic. Um, not sexual, but romantic. Things we would maybe dinner, hikes, things like that. Um, part of me felt that that was expected of me. If I went there and just showed up as a total ice queen and didn't want to touch him or have anything to do with him, he might think that's strange. And so part of that was an attempt to appear normal. Um, also, when I was with Ryan, I felt a sense of safety. He wasn't pressuring me for sex, and I didn't think he was going to haul off and smack me if I said the wrong thing or did something that displeased him. Um, but again, even with all of those things, I wasn't in my right state of mind during that time. She meant every kiss, every caress, every stroke of his brow, every time she kissed his neck, his cheek, his mouth, she meant it. She knew exactly what she was doing. She was completely in the right mind. Yeah. I would speculate that what she had done had actually turned her on. It probably did. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. No, me neither. Not surprised at all, but... Um, I don't think you can fake something like that. You're either into it or you're not. And from Ryan's testimony and somewhat from Jodie's testimony, both of them were into it. Certainly she was into it. And 
Now she's saying she wasn't in the right state of mind. Yeah. Just judge from that what you will. It's just tired old lies. Were you in the fog when you were kissing Ryan? Yes. You're so full of shit. Would you agree that you came away from the June 4 incident rather unscathed? While Travis suffered a gunshot and multiple stab wounds, you only had a bump on your head, a bruise on your head, cuts or scrapes on your ankles, and a possible shoulder injury. As far as um, making comparison of physical injuries, him versus mine, yes, I would have to say that's a, a relatively accurate assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any other questions from the jury at this time? They had some excellent questions, didn't they? They did pretty tense as well. Yeah, and, and once again, you know, questions we'd asked. But um, very, very perceptive. They spotted holes in her story, and I don't think that she filled them in, do you? No, she, did. she tried her best, but she failed. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm guessing either Nermi or Martinez is going to follow up now, so let's see where this goes. Yeah. Mr. Nermi, you may follow up. Oh, perfect. Chris Arias, yesterday you were asked about receiving the uh, Book of Mormon from Travis. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were explaining to us uh, how you read a chapter a day of that book, or basically a chapter a day after you received it. Do you recall telling us that? Yes. Okay. And there were some other questions about, or answers, I guess, that brought up the uh, visits from the missionaries that came over to your house in Palm Desert. Do you recall those questions? Yes. Okay. And what the basis of some of these questions really related to um, the law of chastity. Do you recall that? That's correct. Okay. Now, one of the things that you talked about in answering these questions as it relates to the Book of Mormon, does that contain a sort of list of, as it relates to premarital sex, of activities that are okay and activities that are not okay not in the book of mormon it's oh it's broad it's not it's not listed out in detail in the book of mormon for example the book of mormon doesn't say oral sex is okay or not okay it doesn't spell that out for you no it does not okay you mentioned the missionaries being uh, younger men that came to your house younger men correct that's correct. Okay. And this kind of um, do's and don'ts list, we'll call it, uh, that wasn't in the Book of Mormon, did they give you anything of that nature? No, I had pamphlets, but they didn't have, as far as the law of chastity goes, that was not broken down. No. Okay. What they explained to you from your answers, it seems to be that you weren't to engage in premarital sex, your takeaway of that was penile vaginal intercourse. Is that accurate? Bingo. Well, I considered other forms of sex sex, but after gaining a sort of clarification from Travis and how he explained it, then I came to understand that vaginal sex was the ultimate like place to not go until marriage. And in terms of going to this place, meaning penile vaginal intercourse, um, after these missionaries started coming over, uh, had you, were you still engaging in sex with Daryl Brewer after they came over and started telling you these things? No. And part of what we heard in your questioning is that... Uh, Travis served to 
provide you with uh, elaboration, if you will, on the law of chastity. Is that true? Yeah, he delineated it more for me. So that kind of list of using oral sex as a continued example, this oral sex is okay or not okay, he kind of provided that checklist for you, right? Yes. Okay. Sex, 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 the whole way to think about it. And based on his teachings, if you will, you came away from that with the idea that the law of chastity only restricted penile vaginal intercourse. During Here we go, as expected and as forecasted by us both, once again we're back on the sex talk. Yeah, can't you just bloody give it a rest? There are so many other, so much more important questions that were asked. Why are we going over the law of chastity again? Why are we going over penile vaginal sex again? We've covered this extensively, we covered this microscopically. Why do we have to hear about this again? Is it obfuscation for the jury? I'm sure he gets off on it. You know something? I think you're probably right. After Travis taught you these things, what was your understanding of what the law of chastity prohibited? The law of chastity prohibited vaginal intercourse between a man and a woman, um, and that it should be saved for marriage. That was the black and white of the issue on that. Okay. Now we heard, as you answer these questions and throughout your testimony, of, a, of another guiding principle in your life uh, being the law of attraction. You were asked a few questions about that. Do you remember that? Yes. And one of the things that came up while you were describing the law of attraction, I want to make sure it's clear, you also started talking about something called the secret. So, is the secret part of the law of attraction, or can you, could you just kind of explain that for all of us? The secret is a documentary film that came out in 2006 explaining the law of attraction, so they're synonymous. And there was another movie version that came out in 2007, also the secret, just a few different, a different speaker, um, but it's the same, along this, it's exactly the same thing. It's the law of attraction. So the secret... Was that something that you and Travis, uh, this movie, documentary as you call it, is that something you and Travis uh, watched together or tried to fall, adhere to together? Yes, he introduced me to the movie. Okay. He introduced you to the movie, but the law of attraction was something that you were familiar with before you met Travis. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, we talked a little bit yesterday uh, about your breakups with your boyfriends and I kind of want to go back through that a little bit okay okay you began with Bobby Juarez dating if you will what have you around age 15 correct that's correct the first time what's that the first time yes okay. I was 15 and you mentioned when you were ans answering the questions posed to you yesterday that you broke up with him of, and got back together a few times uh, over the years. Could you kind of explain that to us? Yes. Um, starting at age 15, I broke up with him because I felt the relationship was getting too serious. Um, I didn't talk to him for a few more years. And then when I had called him, and he wasn't responsive, I let that go. And then he called me back and we struck up a conversation and a friendship again. And then some months later, that blossomed into a romantic relationship and I began to fall in love with him. And he's who I would consider my first real true love. Oh, greetings, it is I, the Count. And um, then when the other girl came into the picture, um, I broke up with him, we got back together. Um, she actually came in and out of the picture a few times. Um, and she came from Louisiana, so I broke up with him. Um, there were many things that caused us to break up. Sometimes he would get on his feet 
and have friends that would help him out, and he didn't want anything to do with me. And then other times, um, it had to do with that girl or, or just some little things. But it seemed that we were always getting back together, and then finally, <clears throat> we separated. And then two weeks went by where we didn't talk, and I felt like that was sufficient time. Um, whereas in Costa Rica, when I'd gone there, it was eight days. I felt that was sufficient time, but he came back into my job, and we started talking again, and we got into the same pattern again. And then some months later, um, I didn't see or hear from him for two weeks, and then I received an email from him. And um, I called it. He left a phone number in the email. I went to a pay phone, so he didn't have my phone number, and called it, and we spoke for a little while. And it wasn't a heated conversation, but we eventually just said some things that we needed to say and hung up, and that was the end of it. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that story just as riveting as when I heard it the first time. Do you? Yeah, I mean, nothing has changed. She didn't really tell us anything we didn't know. No, just couldn't take my eyes off it. Could we take a break for a while? It appears my intelligence circuits have melted. And this conversation you just uh, spoke of um, when you were in the, in the phone booth, um, how old were you then when you finally ended things with Mr. Juarez? I was 20. And I'm sorry, I was 19. I was almost 20. Okay. Then this, you, you spoke yesterday about this uh, occasion when you uh, were giving him, you, you gave him groceries uh, after you broke up on one occasion, correct? Yes. Okay. Was that, was that after this last phone call or was this before this last phone call? It was before. I don't remember exactly what time period or even what time of the year. Um, but it was during one of the several breakups that we had, or after that. And after this uh, phone conversation, when you were about 19 in this phone booth, there were no more attempts to contact. You didn't make any more attempts to contact him. Is that what you're telling us? That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, you were asked also about uh, Victor Arias yesterday. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. I'm the invisible, invisible, invisible man. And for a little bit of clarification, uh, and based on what you told us, it sounds like Victor was a gentleman that you became involved with um, sometime when you were in, the, in an off period with Mr. Juarez. Is that accurate? It was during a period where I never thought I'd see or hear from Bobby again or even contact him. Yes. I want to be Bobby's girl. You were asked about a, a trip you made uh, to spend time with his, uh, Victor's family in Costa Rica. Do you recall that question? Yes. Okay. Maybe if, you, if we step back a little bit, what were the circumstances? You met Victor in Costa Rica, right? Yes, I flew to Costa Rica when I was 16, and he and his mother and father and two sisters and his other brother were at the airport to meet me and pick me up. Okay, and how did that, how did that come about that you just go to Costa Rica and spend time with this family? Didn't you know, Mr. Nermi, when Jody is in her marshmallow garden, time means nothing. Geography means nothing. You can go anywhere. You can do anything. You can create any person you want. As long as you keep eating those rancid marshmallows, you will be fine. Yeah, I think she's been eating too many of them, and now she's seeing and hearing things. Yeah, she's vomiting them up, except she's vomiting them up all over us. This was right after my sophomore year, and in September, the beginning of my sophomore year, there was some flyers put up, and it was announced, and... It just sounded so exciting to me. So I went home and told my parents, I'm going to Costa Rica. And they just looked at me like I was crazy. But what I did is I worked at my dad's restaurant and saved up all the money I could um, for the trip. And I think my parents threw a little money toward the trip for me as well. And I was very shocked that they were okay with it and that, that they let me go. But that's how it came about. Okay. So uh, is it uh, accurate then to surmise that this was some sort of uh, exchange program with host families? Yes, it wasn't a long-term exchange, but it was considered an exchange. Um, they have a, a, some kind of rotating semester system, so they go to school in the summer as well. 
and I went to school with them during the day and did things, extracurricular activities on the weekends. It's a shame she didn't stay in Costa Rica, but then again, if Victorarius did exist. So you met Victor when you met this entire, uh, the entire area, Costa Rican Arius family, right? Yes. Okay. And then so when you went to visit, we, we talked about, the, I guess, the continued contact with Victor, the correspondence. Was there still then a, a friendship with his, his family? Yes, we emailed on occasion. Just his um, brother and sister, not all the family members had emails. But, and Victor would um, email my mom. They would email back and forth. And so we're clear, was going back to Costa Rica to clear your head, as you told us about uh, many days ago, was that a matter of trying to rekindle things with Victor, or was this just, was that, was that on the agenda, I guess? No, I, had, I was not interested in rekindling anything with Victor. I was interested in maintaining a friendship, but not a romantic relationship. Rekindling with Victor is a bit like masturbation, isn't it? As it relates to the overall question of your breakups throughout your life, uh, you, were the, you also had a breakup with uh, Matt McCartney, right? Yes. Okay. And we heard about uh, the uh, conversation you had with Bianca and how he was uh, unfaithful to you. You learned that through that conversation. Do you recall telling us about that? Yes. Okay. When in reality, Matt probably only said hello to Bianca and Jody lost her shit. That breakup then... You had a conversation with Mr. McCartney after you spoke with Bianca. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Tell us again how that conversation took place, and if if you could, just the kind of content of the conversation. Um, I went to his father's house when he returned from Brago Springs, and um, when I sh when I arrived, he was on the phone with Bianca, so. He understood what I was there for. Um, so we decided to leave the duplex where his father was living in so that he wasn't privy to our business. And we just we went into my car, which was parked on the street, and just sat in there and had a conversation regarding that. Um, we were both crying. We hugged. We were sad that it was over, but we knew it was over. And it was, it was sad, actually, but it wasn't volatile or anything like that. Oh, my. <laughs> It wasn't volatile, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. As far as after that conversation when you broke up, uh, did you uh, disconnect yourself from Mr. McCartney for a while? Did you still converse right away? Just kind of describe for us the period after that breakup. Um, well, a day or two after the breakup, I sent him an email. It was a really long email, just... One of the ways I, I processed things then was by writing everything down. Aha! There you go. She just gave herself away. Now, she could argue, that's what I did then, but I changed my mind because of Travis, because of the law of attraction. Bollocks. Yeah, it's all crap. She, she can't have it both ways, I'm afraid. She can't have it both ways. If she says she wrote everything down to process everything... Then why the hell didn't she write about the so-called abuse? Exactly. And if she didn't write it in her journal, she probably would have written it down or recorded it somewhere else because you don't go through something like that without some sort of outlet, do you? Well, no, just in case you need it. Yeah, exactly. So just absolutely caught herself out there, didn't she? She did. Um, or emailing it. So... I, I sent him that email, kind of like a goodbye email, just letting him know, in hindsight and retrospect, this is how I feel about our relationship and how it ultimately ended up. Um, and then beyond that, I think I spoke with him one time on the phone, but we went for about a month without talking. Okay. So you go for a month without talking after you send this email, then, then you strike up a friendship. 
Is that our friendship built? But maybe just describe that for us. I don't recall exactly how we um, even rekindled our friendship. Um, I do know that he was looking for seasonal work. And when he found out I was going to be staying in a campground, he's like, oh no, he didn't like that idea. So he came with me, not really, not as an intention to try to get back together with me or vice versa, but to gain employment, also make sure that I was safe, I think, that that was my impression. But he really was looking for work as well. You mentioned, and it was, it was questioned uh, of you yesterday, this idea that eventually this man who you'd been involved with sexually, you got to a point where you viewed him more as a brother. Is there a way for you to put into words how you got to that point? Um, I think with time progressing and the separation, um, it would have been spring, I think 2002, because it was the following spring that I was hired, and I remember Matt and I broke up around September 11, 2001. So it was that following spring that Ventana closed, um, the restaurant closed. And so when the restaurant closed, Matt's income went away. And so he moved to Vail, Colorado for other seasonal work. And I stayed there and um, did little odds and ends things to continue earning a little bit of money. And he stayed in Vail for a while. And when I think the season was up there, he came back to Ventana and was rehired because he had been a good employee. And um, with that space, um, we, I think we just, he had, I think he had a trailer and I went over there just to visit him briefly and we kind of just laughed and joked a little and he thought my blonde hair was weird because I didn't have blonde hair before he left and then I did. So um, yeah, I just we just kind of, we're comfortable with each other, but we were no longer intimate or physical. We don't even really hug often, or we didn't. And so we were just, we just kind of had a, a level of understanding that it feels like another life, to be honest, having dated him. It, that was then, and we're different now, and we respect the fact that we each have a past, and that past is in the past, and we're able to maintain a friendship. I'm not sure which camp Matt McCartney is in right now as of 2022 when we're recording this. But I'm willing to bet a part of him is sorry. Um, he he basically weeps for the day that he ever met Jodie Arias. I'm sure he does. I mean, it's such a shame. But uh, I don't think this guy ever testified either. He, he did testify, but um, I'm not sure whether it was behind closed doors or something, but I understand he did testify in this ah, trial, right. but I'm not sure. I can't seem to find his testimony. Somebody did link it, uh, but I had a look through there, but I couldn't see any trace of uh, of, of Matt. So um, if he has testified and it is on YouTube, I've been unable to find it. If someone could link it in the comments, I'd be really grateful, but. Yeah, that will be interesting. I, 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 I do kind of feel sorry. For, I feel sorry for Ryan, certainly, because his name is going to be forever linked with her. Matt, I feel sorry for. Daryl, I feel sorry for. And I feel sorry for Bobby. I feel sorry for all of them. I feel yeah. for them. I know what you mean. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Please be back in the jury room at 125. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Have a nice lunch. Several plates of green beans later. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. This area, she may step down. Counsel, before you leave, could I see you at the bench for just a moment? Ms. Arias, please take the stand. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermy, you may continue.
Ms. Arias, before we broke for lunch, we were discussing uh, your breakups or, or the history thereof that you were asked about um, yesterday. Uh, we just finished with Mr. McCartney, so I want to move now to your uh, breakup with Mr. Brewer in uh, 2006. Uh, okay? Okay. In that regard, you had said previously that, I'm probably paraphrasing here, but the relationship kind of was fizzling out or, or coming to an end to some degree. Is yes, that? in 2006, okay. yes. Okay. And was that period where, at least in your mind, it began coming to an end, was that before or after you met Travis Alexander? Um, that was, it was starting to fizzle a little bit before. Um, I'd say the summer of 2006 was a big wake-up call for where I was going in my life. And Daryl and I weren't progressing in our relationship. Further evidence of narcissism there. If your relationship isn't working, what's the first thing you try and do? You try and compromise and work it out. Yeah, you work on it. Now, it appears to me that she lost interest because she didn't mention a thing about trying to work it out, certainly independently of Daryl. So I'm guessing that she lost interest. In fact, all this is crap because I'm, I'm guessing that the moment she met Travis, that was it. She was like, he was basically a dog whistle for her. Of course. And I think she was, you know, I'm not sure if she was unhappy with Daryl or if things were starting to fizzle out, but certainly when she met Travis, that was when all interest in Daryl just evaporated. Yeah, and she put all her eggs into this one basket. Yeah, and didn't take them out of that basket until that basket was destroyed. Exactly. Okay. So... But you, as you've told us before, you didn't actually end the relationship with Mr. Brewer until after you went to the prepaid legal convention in Las Vegas. Is that correct? That's correct. I was still officially in the relationship, committed to him. Yes. Officially? What was the last part of that sentence? Committed to him. Committed to him. Yes. Okay. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? And that is why, as you've told us previously, you didn't kiss Mr. Alexander or anything during that conference, correct? <laughs> Was this the reason why you didn't have contact with Mr. Alexander? Yes. Prior to breaking up with Daryl, I didn't have any kind of inappropriate contact with Travis. Okay. Bullshit. And any kind of contact, based on what you've told us in terms of your view of fidelity, would have been inappropriate. Is that accurate? What world? That's my that's my philosophy. Yes, it is now. Personally, yes. Okay. <laughs> so when you go back and you break and. Well, let me ask you this. When you, went, when you came home from the prepaid legal convention, were you thinking, okay, it's time to break up with Daryl? Um, when I left convention, I was, it was painful because I knew that there were changes on my horizon and Daryl would be one of them. I just was, it was difficult for me to make that decision because I loved him a lot, but... It was not, it didn't fit my future anymore because he didn't want the same things I wanted. So when you broke up with him, did you sit down and talk face to face in your home? Yes, we sat at the kitchen table. Okay. Mano a mano, face to face. And in terms of that breakup, was there yelling and screaming? No, there was none of that. Just a civil conversation. And 
in terms of how the relationship ended, it sounds like you would have been the one who at least initiated this conversation. Is that correct? That's right. Oh, world, well, let answer. Yes, I asked if we could talk, and we sat down at the table. Now, at this point in time, you and Mr. Brewer still own the home in Palm Desert together. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Okay. And it sounded like from your previous testimony that you still had a lot of uh, bills to deal with and that sort of thing together, mutual bills. Yes, utilities, mortgage. Mm -hmm. After you broke up with Daryl, how long did the two, the two of you obviously didn't have uh, other places to live at the time of this conversation? Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. We only had the house for living arrangements. Okay. So do you both stay in that house for some time? He stayed until early December, and then he moved back to the Monterey Peninsula. Okay. So... We're talking about, after this breakup, we're talking approximately four months, well, three months, I guess, of cohabitating and not being a couple. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And was there romantic or sexual interaction between the two of you after this uh, conversation? No sexual. The only one romantic gesture he did is before he hopped in his truck and pulled out of town, he kissed me on the lips. I wasn't expecting that, but that was the last time that we had any kind of contact of a romantic nature. And I'm guessing that was like kissing a bloody sardine, wasn't it? The time period between you broke up and the, and the moment in time you just told us about him pulling away in his truck... Was the relationship between you and Mr. Brewer, would you describe it as civil? Definitely. And you were dating, to some degree, you were dating Mr. Alexander during this time period. Is that accurate? I would say we were seeing each other, but we were not boyfriend-girlfriend. Okay. And to your knowledge, was Mr. Brewer dating anyone at this this period of time? To my knowledge, no. Did you feel the need to hide your dating or, or budding relationship uh, with Mr. Alexander? Did you want to keep that from Mr. Brewer? I wanted to keep that from him out of out of being sensitive to his feelings and concerned for how... I didn't want to parade another guy in front of him, so to speak. Okay. Ah, this seems to be one of those rare occasions where the opposite seems to be true. Um, because, you know, men who usually, you know, same age as the wives, sometimes trade their wives in for younger women, don't they? Yes, yeah, some of them do. Yeah, but this seems to be the opposite. Tr Jody, as soon as she saw Travis, well... You know, Daryl was on the outs, wasn't he? Well, Daryl was not an interest to her once Travis was on the scene. Well, let's face it, you know, Travis was like nearly 20 years younger. So, you know, virile, um, you know, if full of raging began. hormones. <laughs> you know, who, who is she going to go for? So, exactly. Yeah. After he moved away... Did you still need to discuss bills and, and things related to the house? Yes. Okay. Uh, apart from having needing to have these uh, business type discussions, were you and Mr. Brewer, would you characterize your relationship with him during this period of time as a friendship? With Daryl, yes. And that chain of friendship, if you will, 
that began even back in 2006, it's still together today. Is, it, is that fair to say? Yes, we're not close, but we're still on friendly terms. I just noticed something, and it's rather odd. We know the way she is, don't we? Yeah, we do. Completely narcissistic, demanding, um, all about her. I am amazed that a single one of her relationships, past relationships, ended amicably. I'm mm. surprised that at least Daryl and Matt, at least, even speak to her. Well, maybe they decided to, you know, just for a quiet life. Why would you want to keep someone like that in your life? You'd want to keep, you know, get them as far away from you as possible. Oh, I'm sure they kept the distance. But probably, yeah. I mean, you know, they kept in touch as long as they could keep her at arm's, arm's length. And, yeah. yeah, but, you know, we've had Daryl come in to testify on Jodie's behalf for the defence. And I, I've got to ask myself why and, you know, how she could just completely... If she wasn't like this before, which I, I'm sure there are elements, and, you know, from what we've heard, she was a difficult teenager. But... I don't know, it's just very weird that a single one of her relationships ended amicably, given how her relationship, the horrific way her relationship with Travis ended. Well, maybe she didn't really love them and wasn't obsessed with them as she was with yeah, Travis. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But she still would have exhibited some sort of petulant, spoiled, demanding, diva-like behaviour. It's, it's who she is. Maybe that's why these relationships ended. Maybe, but what I can't understand is why they have a good word to say about her and, and how they ended amicably. It's just a complete mystery to me, that's all. Maybe they feel sorry for her. I don't know why. I've got, I don't know how anyone in the world could feel sorry for her, but... Well, I'm right. sure they people don't do. feel sorry for her now, but um, well, they might have done it at the time. People do, the, the pro Jody kids. They want lobotomies, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And going back to what we talked about earlier with Matt, uh, who you view, you said, like, as a brother-like figure, you're still friends with Matt today to some degree. Is that accurate? The same. We're not close, um, but we're still friends. Okay. Now, we heard uh, when you were questioned about your breakup with Travis uh, that occurred on June 29th. And what year was that again? Is that 07? Yes, 2007. Okay. This was a telephone call, this breakup, right? Yes. And was, you testified that the next day, in, in responding to the questions, that you were back on the phone with Travis. Is that accurate? Yes. But I can't stay away from you. Why were you back? I mean, you broken up. It would seem natural that perhaps some distance might be in order. Did you want distance? Um, well, we were distant as far as physical distance because I was in Big Sur, California. He was in Mesa, Arizona. But I don't know. I guess I wanted us, I wanted the same thing eventually, which was to be able to be friends with him. But we just had broken up less than 24 hours previous, and I was still in love with him. So I was conflicted, obviously, because I no longer trusted him. You also mentioned, I think the part that makes it a little harder to understand is the part about the fact that the phone conversation got sexual the very day after you broke up. Sexual, that makes it a little hard to understand. Approach, please. You may continue. This sexual conversation with him you had the day after you broke up. Here we go again. 
you freely engaged in it, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Why would you engage in this conversation after breaking up with him the day before? And, and for the reasons that you broke up with him for, on the day before. It goes back to the day before when I broke up with him. He was making promises that he would change. He said that he loved me. And so the conversation didn't start sexual, it started sentimental. And then it moved into more of um, a sexual nature, I guess. He was complimenting me like, you're so hot, that kind of thing. Um, so I just kept talking to him because it was pleasant and he was saying nice things. And then at one point I became aware of the fact that he was masturbating while we were having this conversation. And I was in the driveway of the Red House at Ventana. Why did you have this conversation? Not to Sorry. She just had to throw that in, didn't she? Yeah. She, she couldn't just say that they started off having a nice conversation, it turned sexual. She had to turn around and say that Travis had to have a wank. That's just, he's treading all over his grave. And I don't even think he was. No. I think that is just her. Maybe during the sexual part, but... Not while you're having a, just like a conversation with someone. You don't, you know, pull your pudding out and start to pull it, do you? No, you don't. You won't do that when you get turned on. And I'm guessing that this phone call was a groveling, sniveling apology from her. Um, that's how it started. And she somehow managed to talk him around. That's, And she also persuaded him to have phone sex and didn't obviously didn't tell him she was recording it. Well, no, she didn't. Why, why, why would she? It's her leverage. She is evil. Why did you keep going after you... Why did you keep engaging in this conversation when, as you say, you perceived him to be masturbating? Look, it's trying to think. I don't know. I guess a part of me felt... I had very low self-esteem at the time, and a part of me felt um, he still values me above other people, I guess, that he still is attracted to me even though, and he's trying to win me back and all these things. So I was kind of flattered by it, I guess. Okay. Now the issue uh, came up regarding um, what were termed as suicide letters. Do you recall that coming up earlier today? Yes. I want to show you a few exhibits being 514, 515, 516, 517, 518, 519, 520, and 521. Without speaking to the content, could you just review these uh, exhibits and verify for us that those were the letters you were referencing uh, this morning? Once again, we will draw your attention to the fact that her eyes are completely dry. Yeah, but her nose seems to be leaking yet again. Yeah. Once more. Yes. 
at last. They are. They are the letters. They I are those, sui those suicide letters you were referencing earlier. And they're suicide letters and a drawing of what I wanted my grave to say. And Miss Arius showing you what's been entered as Exhibit 510. You only 510. You had been looking at that of 82607. You've been contemplating suicide for quite some time. Hadn't you? Sustained. You've been contemplating suicide since August 26, 2007. Yes, during that time period after I moved to Wairika, I feel like. Has she been contemplating it since that page? The answer was yes. Sustained. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You've been contemplating it from August 26, 2007 till the time of your arrest? No, there was a break. But and what was the break? After I moved out of Arizona, I didn't feel suicidal um, as much until after Travis passed away. And so, just so we're clear, we're talking about when you left uh, Arizona in the U-Haul uh, in late March or April of 2008, correct? Yes. Okay. Once again, marshmallow garden produce, isn't it? Absolutely. Do you think it's possible that prior to her meeting Travis and developing this really unhealthy and dangerous obsession with him, do you think it's possible that she could have been suicidal? I don't know. Some people who go around saying they're suicidal mostly do it for attention. Even if she was suicidal prior to this, um, or she could, you know, feel the, the feelings of being suicidal. After she met Travis and developed this obsession with him, she found something to live for, I think. And when she lost him, she thought to herself, there's no way I'm losing this guy. And she dug her claws in and she just did everything she could to try and get him. And in the end, she did get him, didn't she? Yeah, in the most tragic way. Yeah. Well, she made sure that nobody could ever love him again and he could never love anyone else again. She did rob the world of, you know, by all accounts, a pretty decent guy, not a saint. But a normal guy with faults like the rest of us. Well, yeah, obviously. There was a question uh, posed to you about what I believe to be this journal entry and also in Exhibit 510. About how you were staying in Rachel's uh, tonight. Do you recall that? Yes. You're being asked about that particular minute or that particular uh, journal entry? Yes. Okay. Is that a minimization that you were talking about? Actually, overall. Um, it was not very specific as to the reasons Travis would be upset. Um, I didn't go into those reasons. I was just voicing a few thoughts. Okay. Uh, that relate to the 
idea of not writing certain things in your journal because out of fear of what Mr. Alexander would think? Yes. Approach with Exhibit 522. Did you take a look at Exhibit 522? Will you give it to yourself and advise us what that is? This is um, a journal entry that I wrote just a few weeks after. I can't see. <laughs> after a few weeks um, after the argument that we had, um, where he wouldn't let me leave the room. Objection. She wants to give a date. That's fine. But beyond that, I would object. I remember the date. Well, the date that you wrote the entry. Oh, the date. I'm sorry. It's eleven five oh seven. And was that your entire entry for 11507? It appears that this is the this is entry is complete and the next one it shows part of 116. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to move to admit exhibit 522. And we caught that as well, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Very long inhale and exhale, almost a sigh. Looked very nervous while she was doing it. She is nervous because she knows that no one's buying a story. Now, is it possible, just throwing this out there, but is it possible that these entries were fabricated after Travis's death? They is could have been, but then again, we don't know. I wonder if it's, I do think it's possible that she fabricated them while in custody, but she certainly could have fabricated them after Travis's death, or I don't know, but that's one explanation, isn't it? Well, yeah, but if any of our viewers know. Yeah, yeah, but I just caught that sigh then, that little nervous moment, and I just thought I'd comment on it because it was just very unusual. It was kind of her facade crumbling there a bit, wasn't it? Yeah, but I think we've seen something like that before with her. Yeah, but she doesn't let it slip off and does she? No, she doesn't, but when it does, you can see you, it. You can tell, can't you? Yeah. And again, we're looking at a date of uh, Monday, November 5th, 2007. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, and you were describing for us um, what this enter entry was actually subsequent to uh, one of the acts of violence that was perpetrated upon you. Is that accurate? Will you repeat that? I'm sorry. This entry was subsequent to one of the acts of violence that was perpetrated upon you. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, when he pushed me, yes. Which act? Overruled. You say he pushed you. We talked about these incidents, so maybe if you could just give us a little more of the details of what specific incident you're talking about. Okay, it was, um, it was a night we had an argument in his bedroom. Um, it was the night that he wouldn't let me leave. I tried to get up and leave and he stopped me and pushed me and I fell down, I fell on my knees. Um, and he basically demanded that I s listen to what he was saying. 
and a short time later I got up to leave again and he did the same thing. Um, the third time I got up, I, he let me leave. He followed me though all the way out to the car, saying things behind me as I walked all the, all the way down the stairs, out the door and out to the driveway. Um, so that was the same night that that happened. This is such a crock of shit. I want to draw your attention to um, there is a paragraph that begins with the number two. Do you see that there? Yes. Two nights ago. Yes. And and I'll move it for you when need be, but. If you could do, be so kind as to read uh, that uh, area to us. Two nights ago, I called Travis to say goodnight and right on the outset of the conversation, he made a point in making it clear to me that he didn't mean all of those harsh words he said the other day. Okay. Um, let me, looks like the sentence goes a little bit into the next page. Could you finish the sentence? and that he felt really bad. Okay. This uh, reference that you make on 11.5 to two nights ago and that he uh, said some mean things or harsh words uh, that he didn't mean, is that related to this incident and the things he said about your family? Yes, the conversation of two nights previous that I say there is a conversation where we were referencing the argument of a week or two earlier to that. Yes. Okay, so I want to make sure I understand you correctly. You had this argument or this incident with him where he's not letting you leave the room and saying some mean things about your family. But then it sounds like you had a conversation about that incident, uh, I guess, what would be on November 3rd. Is that correct? Yes, that was after he found the negative things I wrote about it and made me tear it out. And I think it opened his eyes to some things. Okay. So this isn't a reference to the, 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 the violence in the bedroom, it's a reference to a conversation you had related, sometime later related to the violence in the bedroom and the removal of things from the diary. Yes, and then I documented that conversation two days later, which would be the fifth. Okay. All right. Could you read the next sentence for us? He asked that I forget he ever said any of those. All right. And that's referring to the words he said when? The night of that argument. Okay. The third. I'm oh, sorry? The third of November? The, that's what he said on the third, but he asked that I forget what he said on the night of the argument. Okay. Uh, part of forgiving, in my opinion, is, is to forget and let it go. Cold never bothered me anyway. But you're writing about it. Can you explain that to us? I'm not writing about the part that I want to forget, which are the words. I'm writing more about the experience. Since I, does that say Sunday on the 5th? Okay, Monday. The reason I'm writing on this topic is because that Sunday it was a topic in RS's Relief Society, and that's um, that was a topic in church. It's a, where the women meet for that hour about how once words are spoken, they can't be unspoken, and it just seemed along those themes. So I was journaling about that. Picking up right here where he says, "Even now," could you read that sentence for us? Even now, even still, I'm haunted by those words as another statement just popped into my mind. And 
again, just for clarification, are we talking about words that were said on the third or words that were said uh, during this violent altercation, or are we talking about both? Will you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sweet baby Jesus in the 90s. The words, you say, the words that were spoken uh, still haunt you. Yes. And so which words are you referring to? His harsh words during that time, it was still relatively fresh, and they kept playing like a recording in my mind over and over. So was, they were haunting me in that regard. I'm sorry, are we supposed to be seeing some sort of evidence that he pushed her over? Because if there is any evidence here, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it either. And if he hasn't got to it yet, for the love of God, would you please get to it? Because my ass is going numb here. You say that, uh, start reading from the sentences, I, I won't write it down. I won't write it down, however, as I promised to Travis that I wouldn't do so as part of forgetting it. When did you make that promise to him? Right, we've now got this whole heap of bollocks on the screen, so we've had a read through. And what she wants to forget, so, oh, sorry, what she's promised not to write down is another statement that popped into her mind and the words that were spoken but can't be unspoken. There is nothing in there, is there? Re re referring to any act of violence committed by Travis. More words that were said that, sh that they both rather forget. Yeah, it's not like um, there's any pushing or shoving in there. No, there's, there's, there's nothing. Just statements and words. Yeah, so this is just... Ridiculous. And then she ends on some quote with by Esther Hicks, whoever that is. Um, but there's nothing in there pertaining to Travis committing any sort of violence, be it pushing her, hitting her, body slamming her, you know, torturing her finger, <laughs> anything yeah, like that. Because it never happened. It's all bollocks. The day that he tore out. The entry where I wrote the negative things about that night, the night of the argument. Okay. And the, that is what we saw in terms of the pages that were removed from your diary a few days back? I don't think I, those were the specific ones, but they are in there. Yes, there were some pages torn out. All right. Five trips through the doggy door later. Now, referencing back, uh, you were asked a couple of different questions about uh, men whom you've had an in whom you had an interest in in, we'll say, the spring of 2008 after you moved back to Wairika. Remember being asked about some of that? Yes. And you were, you mentioned uh, an individual by the name of Steve Carroll. Yes. Okay. That's what she said. And if memory serves, that was an individual that you met through a website called LDS Linkup. Is that? Yes. Okay. I think you did a little too much LDS. And was this seems to be implied in the name, but to your understanding, was this somewhat of a, a, a Mormon dating site? Not necessarily dating, it's a Mormon social networking site, so it could be for dating, friendship, family, any of that. They've missed a bit of a golden opportunity there, haven't they? Yeah, we have a little bit, don't you think? Well, LDS Linkup is such a boring generic name, I mean, why not call it Mormbook or Instamorm or something like that? At least it would you know, pretty much unify as exclusively Mormons so that, you know, non-Mormons would give it a swerve if they didn't want to date a Mormon, you know. Yeah, but some people do. Some people do, yeah, but, um, yeah, I just thought that was a golden opportunity missed. So if you see Mormbook and uh, Instamorm being used out there, I want the, the royalties, okay? <laughs> okay. And you, in the spring of 2008... 
even after breaking up with Travis, do you can still identified yourself as a member of the Mormon Church. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And you had mentioned that the church encouraged you to uh, date as much, uh, maybe date's not the right word, but to interact as much as possible. Is that accurate? Yes. Once you become an adult, a legal adult, um, the church encourages you, well, I don't know about teenage years as far as 18, 19, but definitely in, the tw in your 20s, your, the church is in encourages you to focus on the goal of marriage and find that person. And if you're not going to marry a certain person, not to, to put it bluntly, to waste your time with that person. The neck on her is as long as a giraffe. I mean, what a bloody hypocrite. And when we're also talking about interaction as well, we're talking about very um, innocent, if you will, dates. Yeah, I never physically met Steve Carroll. It was only online and brief. Um, but as far as dates, as far as the church policy, they encourage dating. Um, as far as going out on dates in public places, not places where you might be led to, into temptation that kind of thing. Okay. So in this time period then, in the spring of 2008, you would have been how old? 27. Okay. There is a very famous club, not a physical building, but a group of people who all died at the age of 27, isn't there? Yeah, there is. There's quite a long list as well. So is there's Brian Jones, there's Amy Winehouse, uh, Heath Jim, Ledger. Yeah, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, uh, Jimi Hendrix, all unbelievably talented. Uh, there's one name I wish that could have been added to that list at that time, with no talent. And we kind of heard at least how 30, 31, that kind of age was a magic number, if you will, for uh, single Mormon men, correct? I wouldn't say a magic number, it's more like a dreaded number. Okay, a dreaded number. Uh, so you were at a point in time in your life at this time where uh, you were, were you also at a point in, in time in your life where you were also seeking marriage and family because you were getting close to this this number this dreaded number as well yes um i wasn't as close as travis the number applies to both men and women um you're expected to be married by that age not everyone does get married by that age in the church but it's more or less expected of you and um obviously i was getting closer by the day and when i ultimately make the determination of whether or not I would want to spend my life with someone, I would need plenty of time with that person first. I can't just pick somebody and say, let's go. So... Okay, that's so question, whether or not she dreaded the day or she... Well, I guess one of the things that makes um, 30 uh, a dreaded number in your church is not turning 30, but it's turning 30 and being single, is that accurate? Turning 31 and being unmarried. Okay. So at age 27, you were, weren't seeking to avoid turning 30, but you were seeking to um, be married and start a family before that age. Is that accurate? Yes, 31. It's 31. Okay, 31. But yes, that's accurate. Okay. So in that regard, uh, you were maybe not exclusively, but part of the reason you're on LDS LinkUp is to find a, a potential boyfriend or find a potential mate. Would that be accurate? Yeah, somebody that I might be able to progress with. Okay. Not sure how true it is that she used this site LDS or, or LinkUp or whatever it was. Um, but I very much doubt it was to find a husband. I think it was her taking a punt to see if she could find any like-minded men who didn't mind 
either bending the rules or breaking them of chastity. Yeah, and I guess she found one. Well, she found Ryan, who I don't think broke any of the rules. No, he, d he didn't break any of the rules. No. Um, and she's saying that, you know, well, she implied that he wanted to, obviously the other way around, because she projects, projects, projects all the time, doesn't she? She does, yeah. She mirrors it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. She's just becoming so see-through. So, and Mr. Carroll was one of those individuals, at least you were interested in or early on or to some degree, right? I met Steve Carroll online sometime in... Objection. She was asked if she was interested in that one she met. Sorry. Answer the question. Was he a person that you were at least beginning to explore an interest in? Yes. Somewhat. And at that point in time, Mr. Dixon, we've heard about was only a friend uh, and not a romantic interest because he was not a member of your church. Is that correct? Um, I can't say that my interest in him was not romantic, but it was also it was something that I would not pursue because he was not a member of the church. So I kind of put a stop loss on any feelings that may have developed had we gone that route, but we never did. Okay. So now she's being picky. Yeah, I thought she didn't care. Yeah. Well, she didn't usually care, you know, whose vehicle was parked in a loading bay, but appears she's got standards now. Oh, hoo, hoo. And Mr. Burns was another individual, Ryan Burns, that you were interested in at this point in time as well. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. But I want to be clear as well. You weren't... You hadn't even met Mr. Carroll in person, correct? That's correct. We just emailed a few times. And apart from meeting Mr. Burns at a business meeting uh, in Oklahoma City, you had not met him in person again since that initial meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. A meeting I didn't even remember, actually. Okay. So... At that point in time, really, this spring of 2008, <clears throat> based on what you told us, it would it be correct to assume you wouldn't have identified yourself as having a boyfriend at that period of time? That's correct. In that regard, in this period of time, what was Mr. Alexander to you? He was my ex-boyfriend. He was kind of like a best friend in a way because we were still very close. Um, it was nothing more than an obsession. The best way to put it is that it was complicated, but we were not in a committed relationship. Had any of these... <clears throat> Well, you were still having sexual interaction with him, at least over the phone, uh, as we heard in May of 2008. That's accurate, right? Yes, that's accurate. Had you also talked about being sexually monogamous with... Uh, one person if you were dating them or they were your boyfriend, correct? Did you ask if I had talked about that? No, well, you, 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 yeah, you mentioned that before in your yes. testimony, that you were sexually monogamous in the context of, of a relationship. Yes, I am. And yes. a relationship is the only context, that actually, that you've engaged in sexual activities. Is that correct? In a relationship? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, aren't we just bouncing around faster than the world's bounciest wallaby? I mean, we're back to sex now, aren't we? Uh, I'm sure he, he's getting off on this, or is he hard up or something? <laughs> well, another thought has occurred. I mean, we may be doing 
you know, Mr. Nermy a complete disservice here. Maybe it's her saying to me, to, to him, every morning before the, you know, the session starts, I want you to concentrate on asking me about my sex life today. It's perfectly possible. She's, yeah. she's in the driving seat. Yeah. yeah, but at the end of the day, you can't keep going over the sex life. There's only so much you can talk about it, and we've been through forensic detail, the need to move on to the murder. It is a murder case, not a sex case. Most ordinary defendants would be hugely uncomfortable with talking about their sex life. On, not just in front of a jury, but in front of a public gallery, and certainly in front of millions of people watching. Have you heard her say once that she feels uncomfortable about, and she doesn't want to talk about her sex life? I haven't. No, she's just answered the questions blindly. I mean, she may have said it once, like early on in the trial, but if she did, that was just show, because she is gleefully sharing every moment that she can, and Nermi, whether it's on purpose or not, whether it's strategy or not, he's enabling it, isn't he? He is. Had things progressed with Mr. Carroll, Mr. Burns, or anyone else, would that have meant the end of the sexual interaction with Mr. Alexander? It would have, he would have been cut off. I think you had mentioned an all access pass that would have transferred to somebody else, I guess you could say. Okay. Shut up! To your knowledge, did Travis know that? He knew that I was loyal, and he knew that... Did he know it? Yes or no? To your knowledge, did Travis know that you were loyal? Yes. And I'm sorry, Ed. I said yes, I'm sorry. Three days later. Talking about the trip that you began on June 2nd. Did, was Travis aware of your plans to go to Utah? Yes. Nope. And based on your belief, do you believe he might have sensed that you were going there for exploring another potential boyfriend? As her belief, Judge. Yes, because he teases me about it on the tape. Um, when she was asked whether or not, it's a yes or no question, whether or not he sensed it. Why did you sense that he had this suspicion? Um, when I mentioned I was going to Utah, he kind of was asking, well, why are you going to Utah? And I told him to see friends. Sustained. Come off it. If he'd have known that she was going to Utah, he wouldn't have given a tin shit in a Bollington sewer, would he? No, I think he would have actually really been glad. Yeah, he, you know, I, I think a part of him would probably have wished her happiness, but most of him would have been relief that she'd found someone else, you know, to occupy her obsession and yeah, not him. But he also might have felt sorry for the guy a bit as well. Wouldn't surprise me if Travis, you know, would try and find out who it was and got in touch with him and said, said to him, you know, Ryan, stay, stay clear of this woman. She's an absolute psycho. He was inquisitive about the purposes of your trip. Would that be accurate to say? He was inquisitive, yes. And based on the verbiage he used, you believe this, his inquisitive nature related to assuring that this trip didn't involve another guy. 
I don't know about assuring, but it related to his desire to find out if that's what it was about. Okay. You were also asked about uh, your, as it relates to the trip, the gas cans. That's a few different questions about the gas can. But the one I want to focus in on, Jody, is the question related to uh, a, a response you made related to getting the gas cans from, from Daryl. Do you remember being asked about getting the gas cans from Daryl? Yes. Okay. Was taking gas cans on a trip, and, and, and your answer uh, seemed to be, was something to the effect that that was common practice for you. Is that accurate? Only after we moved to the desert and realized the extreme conditions of the desert in the summer. A thought's just occurred. Maybe she got the gas cans and filled them up because she needed them to huff. Yeah, it's a possibility. I mean... Maybe she was like a gas huffing addict. Who who knows? I mean, she's got the nose for it, hasn't she? Yeah, I mean, she was probably high as a kite. Ah, oh, made a joke there. Who knows? Ha <laughs> ha. All right, let's carry on. I didn't take them on all the trips, just within desert areas. For example, if I was going to Portland, I wouldn't take gas cans. Portland, Maine, or Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Now, as it relates to this, this trip and kind of what was going on in the interaction you were having in this time period with Travis, you were questioned about the trip that Mr. Alexander was going to take to Cancun. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. Okay. And you were also asked uh, to some degree or, or earlier about uh, this woman uh, that you saw Travis making out with in, uh, and I'm going to use the word making out, for simplicity in his home. Do you recall being asked about that? Yes. Okay. And over the course of, of your relationship, uh, not perhaps when he was doing it, but did you know that Mr. Alexander was dating a girl whose name at the time was Lisa Andrews? Not while he was dating her. I found out afterward. Okay. But, but during the course, you found out afterwards meaning, but still during the course of, of your relationship. During the course of... And I should be careful here. During the course, when I said relationship, uh, I should have said friendship with, with Mr. Alexander. Yeah, whatever our relationship would be defined as. Yes, I found out during that time, I guess. Oh, that relationship could be very easily defined. Stalker and victim. Yeah, that's true. But I just hope she doesn't bloody waffle on again about how she looked through the window and... Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked about that, but that just doesn't make sense. If if someone says to you, yeah, come on over, they're not going to be, you know, snogging someone who they know will make you jealous. So that's just, it's just pathetic. It's a load of crap. Yeah. And when you found out that didn't end, the sex didn't end, is that accurate? I think we did have sex because I found out two days before I pulled out of town so I think we did sleep together again after that fight okay so in a few days you pulled out of town meaning when you moved to Wairika um yes two few days because it happened the same day that he choked me okay yeah pathetic and well obviously we know that it didn't stop because you had sexual relations with him on june 4th or with travis alexander on june 4th as well right yes i did have 
sexual relations with that woman. And you had, even after you had this knowledge about him dating Lisa Andrews, you also engaged in phone sex conversations with him, correct? Yes. Okay. While I'm on the topic of phone sex conversations, a, a, a question was posed to you uh, about whether or not you had recorded uh, other phone sex conversations with Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that? I think that happened yesterday. Yes. And you said that you had recorded those conversations, if I recall correctly. Is that right? That's right. Do you know what became of those? Um, after June 4th, I deleted them. And just so we're clear, was this on the same phone that the May 10th recording was found on or on a different phone that you deleted these recordings? It was on the phone that was replaced by the, the phone that the May 10th recording was on that phone. I believed it was stolen a week later, so I got another replacement phone through the insurance that I had on the phone. And so the subsequent recordings were on that phone. And then after everything happened, I deleted it to, well, one, it's embarrassing as hell, but two, I didn't want that to be known about Travis either. Okay. <clears throat> so, we know about uh, Lisa Andrews and the girl that was uh, standing outside the window. Uh, you were also, and, I, and without going into names, you also mentioned that Travis had an interest in uh, having a threesome during your relationship. Is that correct? Yes. And that involved another woman, correct? Yes. Okay. And you told us that that was something that you were, I believe your words were, willing to go along with. I'm not sure if it had gone up, gone up to the moment, if I would have gone along with it or not, but I entertain the idea with him. Okay. Considering the various reports of the, uh, shall we say, physical dalliances, if you like, she's had in prison, uh, we don't think it would have taken much for her to, to go over, would do we? No, not really. No, we, we don't think it would have taken much persuading at all. And on this phone call as well. Before we talk about the phone call, uh, you had told us that you knew about the trip to Cancun. I think it was, you said, somewhere in the ballpark of a year before it was to take place. Is that correct? Yes. It was announced right around the time that he and I broke up. Was uh, there any point in time when Mr. Alexander had asked you to accompany him to Cancun? No, never. I always thought it was the trip to Cancun that was the straw that broke the camel's back for her. But I do now think it was the letter that Travis sent to Lisa Andrews over Facebook. I think um, the fact that she, you know, she wanted to kill Mimi Hall she kind of built up resentment towards Mimi in the week, you know, afterwards, because Mimi was lucky enough to be going to Cancun with Travis. Yeah, but you, even though Mimi Hall wasn't interested in Travis in that way. Yeah, but Jody didn't know that. I mean, we, we don't know, we have no evidence to suggest that Travis shared that information with her. Um, I don't think he would, because it would make him possibly lose face and yeah yeah so i don't think he would you know give jody that information and, and she's not going to get it from mimi so i don't think jody knew that mimi wasn't in mimi wasn't interested romantically in travis but travis was definitely interested in you know lisa andrews oh definitely 
But it's a mystery why Lisa, at, I can't remember, it probably was covered um, when she testified, why she didn't, she didn't go to Cancun with him. I think she'd broken up with him at the time. Yeah, she? yeah I think and she was, that was... Um... They, they, they weren't on great terms. But anyway, it's just, I honestly think, I used to think that the Cancun trip was the main reason Travis was killed, but I no longer think that, although I do think it was one of the reasons that she murdered him. Oh, yeah, it's definitely one of them. Yeah, just pure blind jealousy on her part. And did the idea of going to Cancun with Mr. Alexander, was that something that you ever, did you ever ask him, I'd like to go to Cancun with you or something to that effect? No, I never asked him anything like that. Okay. It's a lie. When did you know that Travis was dating or had an interest in Murray Hall? It was sometime in late winter, early spring, 2008. It was sometime, somewhere in the first quarter of 2008, I would say, but it was before we went to convention. I remember that. And you still uh, engaged in, in sexual behavior with Mr. Alexander even after that knowledge, correct? Correct, yes. And at some point in time, well, you knew that his interest in her was it your understanding that his interest in her was more than fleeting, shall we say? At first, um, he didn't tell me a lot. He just showed me pictures of her. And then after that, I understood that he believed that he was receiving signs from God that she was to be his wife. When he showed you pictures of her, was it with also the expression that... Uh, he had a romantic interest in her. Yes. I think a lot of it with Jody as well, when it came to Marie Hall, was jealousy because Jody was considered, you know, a beautiful woman by some. I don't know who, but some people consider it. Whereas Mimi is beautiful, but she is elegantly beautiful. Whereas Jody isn't elegantly beautiful. Yeah, and the fact that um, Travis yeah. probably saw Mima as a potential wife. Yeah. And Jody hated that. Yeah. Jody was basically, compared to Mimi, she was trailer trash. Of course she was. Um, Mimi had like a, a natural beauty, whereas Jody had to work on it, didn't she? Yeah, and even then it didn't do much good. Especially with that turnip in the middle of her face. <laughs> do I not like that? Do you recall if that... Uh, do you recall when that happened? When he showed me the pictures? Yes. Oh... It would have been in early 2008. I don't recall exactly the month even. Okay. Why, in your half of the equation then, you, you, you know that he's interested in this other woman. Are you still interested in, are you still willing, I should say, to engage in sexual behavior with Mr. Alexander? I'm sorry, here's a nympho. Well, I was conflicted. Um, they weren't dating like officially exclusively. Um, they were not boyfriend, girlfriend. That was my understanding. They had gone on two dates or three. Um, so I didn't feel like I was enabling him to cheat on her by any means. But at the same time, I also was conflicted with the idea that what we're doing is not 
helping either of us spiritually, especially if he thinks he just met his future wife. So it was, I was conflicted. Can you possibly conceive of that ever happening in her head, feeling conflicted? Well, no, not really. She can say the words, but... Doesn't mean them. Yeah, exactly. She's too narcissistic. She's too self-centered to feel conflicted about anything that doesn't involve her. Yeah, it has to involve her for her to be conflicted. And the only f way she was involved in this was the sex she was having with Travis, which she enjoyed. Any bit of closeness, togetherness, any time to be with him, she she loved. But um, she was just driving him nuts. And he, basically, she drove him into back into the arms of Lisa Andrews. And I think that his negative experience with Jodie may have wanted him to pursue more with Marie, M Mimi Hall. Yeah. Yeah, perfectly possible. The conflict that you described that you were going through... And I, I know you can't read Travis's mind, but were you of the understanding that that he was conflicted as well, or was he simply just still interested in, in, in engaging in sex with you? Conflicted about what? Well, he has this girl, shows you a picture, says this is going to be my future wife. That's what you just described for us, right? Yeah, not when he showed me the picture, but he did share that with me, yes. Okay. Yet, he never stopped, based on what we heard in May 10th, and through your testimony, he, ne he never, to your understanding, lost a desire to have sex with you. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. That was the only hold that she had over him, and she exploited it to the fullest, didn't she? Yeah, the fact that he found her irresistible. Yeah, and uh, that he couldn't, you know, keep her away because he just couldn't get enough of her physically. I mean, she pushed, as we said, we pushed. she pushed all of his buttons physically. So that's the unfortunate thing. If he could have kept his libido under control and, you know, maybe concentrated on finding a relationship instead of just sex... Maybe he would have been, you know, still walking among us. But we don't blame Travis for that. That's not his fault. He didn't know that she was going to go all psycho and kill him, did he? Of course he didn't. No. When you saw this picture of Marie Hall, and he says, this is going to be my future wife, are you jealous? I didn't feel jealous. Yes, you did! Yes, you did! And he didn't say, this is going to be my future wife. He just said, this is a girl he's interested in. Um, but when he began to talk about her, I can't say it was jealousy. It was kind of bittersweet, because I knew that I wasn't going to marry him. But I still had feelings for him, and I knew I needed to move on. Um, and I knew our relationship was unhealthy. So I still have feelings for him, but it's more like bittersweet, because I still have a desire for him to be happy, as well as me to be happy. Okay. And you mentioned you know you, you knew you weren't going to marry Travis. There's conversation on the tape about you know marrying other people and whether they will live up to your sexual relationship that you had with Mr. Alexander. Do you remember that discussion being on the tape? Yes. Okay. So even as late as May of, of 2008, you knew you weren't going to marry Travis. You had no desire to marry Travis. Is that accurate? I knew I wasn't going to marry him, and I can't say that I had a desire to marry the Travis that I knew as Travis to be at that point. Yes, that's accurate. Okay. Lying bitch. The fact that, well, back in 2008, in the spring of 2008, you said Travis never asked you to go to Cancun. Did you have a, a, a passport at that time? Yes. You could have gone? Okay. 
did you have ever, as it got into May and, and June of 2008, did you have ever have any expectations that you would be going on this trip? No, it was never a discussion. This international travel would take some preparation, correct? Yes. Were you jealous in any way that he was taking Miss Hall to Cancun? I didn't know he was taking Mimi Hall until after June 4th. Until after June 4th? Yes. You have to persuade me much better than that. Did you ever, without telling us his response, did you ever inquire what, who are you taking? I did mention it after I moved back to Irika, and that's how, that's when he mentioned the babysitter of his friends. Okay. And he didn't tell you the name of this babysitter? No, just that it was a trade-off for debt he owed. Now, you spoke about, in response to one of the, the questions, about having unconditional love for Travis. Do you remember speaking about that? Yes. And would it be fair to say you still have that today? Yes. You are way out of line. You were asked a couple of questions about your ability and reasons to stay with Mr. Alexander after a couple events. One of those events was when he had sex with you while you were asleep. Remember being asked that? Yes. My question to you then is, it, was it that unconditional love that allowed you to keep being with him even after that point in time? There may have been an element of that, but it was more because at that time I was in love with him, so, and I was already familiar with him physically, emotionally, um, his personality, all that. I was familiar with him in a lot of ways, so when that happened, um, and because I was in love with him, it didn't feel like he had violated me in a big way. Like it was something that just happened not necessarily intentionally, kind of by accident. Oops, let's move on and not do that again, was kind of how I looked at it. I'm trying to put myself in her shoes as to why she would be so obsessed with him. And when you think about it, when she first met him, she runs into this guy who is a motivational speaker, public speaker, um, you know, goes on behalf of the company he works for and motivates people to feel good about themselves, make money, etc. Yeah? Yeah. Um, also very charismatic, has loads of friends, has a wide social circle. She coveted that. She, she, has n she had no idea what any of that was like. She had none of that. And she saw those things and thought, hang on, I want those things as well. And she coveted it. And because she didn't have Travis's people skills, his charisma, his likability, she took it out on Travis because she couldn't have what he had. Yeah, because she's not as great, great as he was. Yeah. He wasn't as um, magnetic to people exactly. as he was. So that's what I think basically turned her ire against him, that he had something that she never could. He had likability. He, he was relatable. You know, he opened his mouth, people smiled, people liked him. When she opened her mouth, people were scared. <laughs> Probably because of the things she'd come out with. Yeah. That's the fundamental difference between them both, and that is why I think she ended up murdering him, because... Oscar Wilde once said, well, each man kills the things he loves. And she loved that part about him and she wanted it. She couldn't have it. No. The question then, I guess, if, if you could describe for us 
What do you mean? How, I asked you about unconditional love, and you said you know it was because you loved him. Uh, what's, the, what's the difference in your mind? Between unconditional between, love and being in love? No, between, between love or being in love, however you want to phrase it, and this unconditional love that you speak of. Well, I think there are different kinds of love. I have unconditional love for my family members, friends. Um, I think I had mentioned before that I have a certain, like there's an advancement, I guess you could say, I have a certain amount of love for everybody. <laughs> oh! Um, Travis, it was a deeper unconditional love because I had, um, personally inside, I had a desire to see him be happy. Um, and then being in love is more, a little more intense. It, um, it's some, I, I've never been in love with more than one person at a time, so it's an individual thing or experience for me. And um, it feels good, that kind of thing. Okay. You mentioned, um, well, you were asked about being able to stay with him after seeing what you saw him do in January 2008. Was that being in love or was that the unconditional love that allowed that to keep going? I don't know how much I was still in love with him by that time. There was definitely unconditional love and it was strong. Um, I don't know if she knows the difference between unconditional love and obsession. I'd say there was still an in love element there, but it wasn't as strong as it had been nine months earlier. It sort of began to wane a little bit. Okay. You were asked about uh, Travis and his sex and its correlation to anger and um, the de-stressing that was brought up in your answer. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And I want to know a little more clarification when you say, and you, you made a comment that this was like code in your relationship. De-stress was like a code, right? Right. Okay. So uh, maybe you could help us by breaking that code, what de-stressing meant. De-stressing means to relieve stress in any form through sex. Okay. I don't know why, but she keeps talking as though de-stressing through sex is something that was unique to her and Travis. When it's not, we all, we've all done it, haven't we? Yeah, it's not just bleeding her. I mean, you come home after a really stressful day at work or you have an argument with your partner, best way to get rid of that is, you know, a little bit of together time, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, so it's not exactly an alien concept to anyone. Well, I think it is to her because she doesn't, she has no concept really of other people and other people's desires. So she probably thinks she's the only person in the world who has done this. Yeah. Truly. Um Another example of a narcissist is Gene Simmons. He basically, when he was a young guy, he thought he was the only person that ever wrote songs. So that's two pure narcissists there for you with similar sort of traits. Yeah. Through any form of sex. No, through any form of stress, through sex, I guess any form. Whatever meant his climax because that would help him relax. Okay. You also mentioned that, all, that this system, if you will, this relaxation, uh, also correlated to his anger. Do you recall talking about that yesterday? Yes. Okay. So can you explain that to us? Yes. Sometimes we would argue, and if sex followed that immediately after the argument, it signaled the end of the argument. Um, there were times, like when the fight where he wouldn't let me leave, um, I left, finally, and he called me to come back, and I came back, and we had sex, and we were done fighting. So it changed the mood, the atmosphere, the energy. Um, 
and it put him in a better mood. Okay. The juror that asked the question about skank, I bet you they sat there now inwardly nodding going, yep, I was right. If, if you can, I want to I want to see if we can use an example that you've talked about during the course of this trial and this um, anger, the, the end of anger through sex that you talked about. Do you remember telling us about on June 4th how after the CD didn't work you threw the CD on, or he threw the CD on the ground and eventually this led to him grabbing you by the arm and bending you over the desk. Do you recall telling us about that incident? Yes, but to be clear, he checked the CD at the wall, like it was on his desk. He hit the wall, probably not much farther than this desk, and it it rolled backward. Okay. But you know the incident we're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. You had made a comment to us that you were okay with this activity, the sexual activity, because it was an alternative to him getting more angry or perhaps physical. Is that correct? Yes. Is that then a <coughs> illustration of what you're talking about related to sex and anger? Yes, that's another example. Okay. And as it relates to June 4th, and what happened in the bathroom, sex as a way of quelching this anger was never an option to you in the bathroom. Is that accurate? Yes, It's stained. Wow, dear, how fed up Judge Stevens sounded then. Yeah, I'm getting a bit fed up with this at the moment with her. And I'm, I'm just sick of seeing her and the sound of her voice. I just wanted to get off that stand. Was sex an option available to you after you dropped the camera on June 4th as a way to de-stress Mr. Alexander? Uh, definitely not immediately. It certainly wasn't in the heat of that moment. You were asked about uh, the gun when you learned of the gun. Do you recall being asked that? I think that happened yesterday. Yes. And you said that you became aware of that in 2007 when you were working as his uh, housekeeper, correct? Correct. What was your understanding of how Mr. Alexander had acquired that gun? My understanding of how he got the gun is that it, my understanding is that. She is desperately trying to come up with a convincing story here, but she can't. You can tell, can't you? Of course you can, the way she keeps stopping and starting and thinking. If if that was the case and she had an answer, she'd say it like that. Yeah, if she, you know, had anywhere near of a clue of what she was being asked, she'd just come straight back with it. Now, nah, whatever you're about to hear is just bollocks like everything else that comes out of a gob. His father used to... That's her understanding, it's not his statements. Hearsay. Approach, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 3.20. Please remember the admonition, you are excused. No, Your Honor, I wish the to state to expand upon their, their argument is not it's a person's sense of impression, Roger, it's a hearsay exception. 
right. I have not seen the letters. For Martinez, you've had a chance to look at them. What's the state's position? Uh, they are hearsay and do not meet a council's description of a present sense impression. There has to be an action uh, in conformity therewith, is my understanding, and she's still here. Council, please approach. Now, there were some letters that turned out to be forged, um, written by someone, I'm not sure who, I don't know if it was Jody Salme or whatever, I think the word, I think Donovan was, you know, thrown around as someone who might have written them. But it was uh, allegedly purporting to be from Travis and it was confessing to all of this, the abuse, you know, being into kids and stuff like that. So I yeah. wonder if that is what they're talking about, these letters. Could, I could be wrong. Could be. Uh, let us know in the comments, please. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermy, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Arias, the gun you discovered, Mr. Alexander owning, was that, was it your understanding that his ownership of said gun was to be kept secret? Yes. Now, continuing on the line of questions, uh, you were asked, as it relates to June 4th, uh, there was a question about you deleting photos from the camera. Do you remember hearing that question? Yes. And we heard early in your testimony in this regard that you were budding professional photographer, correct? Yes. My ass. And being such, were you familiar with the operation of a digital camera? Yes. To your knowledge, how and or where are images on a digital camera saved? On the memory card. Okay. Now, in terms of your understanding prior to June 4th, if an image was deleted off a camera, were you of the belief that it simply went away for good? No, as a digital photographer, my understanding is that. How she would know this technical aspect. She's trying to answer the question. Have a role to me answer. As a digital photographer, my understanding is that the image stays on the card, um, but it's not something that the average person can recover. You can't, you can't get it back, but unless you have a lot of money to get it back. Did you ever have experience to try to? Well, no. Let me rephrase that. Um, based on the fact that we saw the camera in the washing machine and it had a memory card in it, you didn't take it, the camera with you, did you? What in God's holy name are you blathering about? Objection meeting. Overall, me No, I did not take it with me. Surprise, motherfucker! Now it was question of you regarding Mr. Alexander shaving. Do you remember that? Yes. And I think you asked specifically about um, Exhibit 503 and the picture you took of him shaving. Do 
Remember seeing that picture a couple days ago? Yes. Okay. You had made the commentary that Mr. Alexander uh, shaved the old-fashioned way. When you made that commentary, were you talking about the old hot towel and razor treatment, or were you talking more about just a razor in general? I guess when I saw the shave cream, it just reminded me of the old-fashioned way. I know that sounds silly because shaving cream is always used, but that's what I meant when I said that. How the bloody hell else are men supposed to shave without <laughs> soap? Is she on the moon? Maybe she doesn't use it. She probably doesn't. I mean, I'm buggered if I'm waxing my face. I'm sorry. That's just not happening. Do you use soap or shaving foam? Well, it's the same thing, really. I suppose. I mean, you can get shaving gel now. I mean, shaving gel's good. But, yeah, I use either. But you've got to use soap. If you try and dry shave yourself, you'll end up with bloody... Cuts and all sorts. Yeah, and you'll get shitloads of spots for ages. So, no, not a good idea. You were also asked about your the gun coming into your hands that you grabbed from this closet correct correct okay. and your testimony was that the gun was up in this area somewhere correct in the corner correct okay Now, you were asked about whether or not it was in a holster or not. Do you recall that for sure? On the day of... She was asked about the gun and she indicated it was in a holster. It was stained. You've been a naughty, naughty nermy. Now don't do it again. Are you sure that it was in a holster? On the day of, I don't remember whether it was in the holster or not. When I first discovered it, I don't recall seeing it in a holster, but at one point it was in a holster. Yes. Now, you were asked about some of the cleanup efforts you made. Did you ever, to your recollection, straighten anything up in the closet? Not to my recollection. If what happened in that closet happened the way she said, then there'd be stuff all over the place. It wouldn't be so neatly stacked like that. Well, yeah, I mean, she would, you know, of trying to get to the gun on the top shelf, she would have, like, scrambled up and just chucked everything. Yeah, um, in, in order to get it. Yeah. Um, you know, if it did take place, then she could have gone in her fog and I say that with quote marks um, and tidied everything up but let's face it nothing happened in this closet it all happened in the hallway in the bathroom yeah that's where it took place you also mentioned as it relates to this or you were also asked I suspect uh, as it relates to this incident this uh, question of caulking the firearm doing anything to it and you said you didn't recall doing anything of that nature do you recall saying that yes i really don't remember okay but you mentioned i think your word was that you had some familiarity with guns do you recall saying that yes could you explain to us what you mean what you meant by that yes i never had any formal training but uh, Daryl and I used to go camping at Kirk Creek in Big Sur, California, um, every summer, and he brought his gun, and as a safety precaution, he showed me where the safety was. Um, I think it's called a magazine, where the, all the bullets are, and how to cock it and that kind of thing. Um, I know there are different kinds of guns, but that's kind of the extent of the familiarity I had, and also the... Um, 
shop owner who sold me my 9 millimeter. Well, I guess we're talking prior June 4th, so that was after. But other than that, I had a general familiarity, but not, I know that guns, each gun type is, is a little different. So I couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell you too much about it, just more than much beyond point and shoot kind of thing. She seems to me to be rather methodical. And I'm guessing, as we said last video, when she stole her grandparents, her grandfather's gun, she probably went out and did some target practice. But I'm guessing that she not, you know, took it apart, but she kind of figured out how to use the magazine, figured out where the safety was, had a good look at it. Well, she lived with a grandfather, so she would have probably come across that gun a few times. Yeah, she probably would have seen him handling it or... You know, exactly. as, as she said, you know, she had some familiarity from when she went camping with Daryl. How true that is, we don't know. Yeah, because Daryl never mentioned it in his testimony. Well, once again, we don't know whether to believe anything she says. But, you know, giving her the benefit of the doubt, if she has some practice with Daryl, then, yeah, she's going to know what a safety is. She's going to know what... She's, she certainly knows what a magazine is. She's going to know how to shoot. I mean, we live in England where, you know, we have gun control. I've... It's been years and years and years since I've seen an actual handgun, and that was on a copper. So even I know what a magazine is, even I know what a safety clip is, even I know what one in the chamber means. Yeah. <laughs> so if I know what it means, she's going to know what it means. Of course she does, since she's had practice. Yeah. You were also asked about where uh, various items went on June 4th, uh, the camera uh, being one of them as it relates to this photograph. Does this photograph uh, display for us where the gun was? Does it, is that area covered in that photograph? The gun? No. Or excuse me, the camera. Yes. Could you uh, point to that where the camera went? I was right about, the mat used to be right about here, and I dropped it on the mat and kind of bounced by the tub. Okay. This object here? Yes, that one. Is that the mat? Yes. Okay. The twat sat on the mat. Now, for sake of clarification, since we've been talking about mats, was there a separate one for the shower and one for the tub, or is it just one mat? I don't recall there being a mat for the tub. So this mat, were, were you at one point in time then ne is kneeling on this mat when you're taking the photographs? Yes. Okay. Now, you were asked about the knife. The knife, to your recollection, was the knife ever with you in your car? Not at any point in time, ever, to my knowledge and recollection. Did you ever have any knowledge or recollection of disposing of this knife at any point in time? Not disposing of it. The only vague recollection I have is putting a knife in the dishwasher. And again, I'm not sure if I'm confusing that with another time or if it was that day. It's... Okay. Well, that means she definitely put it in the dishwasher because judging by what she says in the sentencing, um, it's probably a good bet to say she's telling the truth there. But I reckon she ran it off under the tap first. Mm, yeah, one of Travis's roommates might have opened it up and thought, oh my God, what's this doing here? It's blood on it. Yeah, so yeah, she probably ran it under the tap first and then put it in. So yeah, I'd guess this is one of the few occasions when she's been sat on her ass there. She's been telling the truth. Yeah, but I mean, she did try and clean up after herself, so yeah. I reckon she that's why she probably put it in the dishwasher. She did a shit job, though, didn't she? <laughs> yeah. You were asked various questions about 
June 4th, is it related to some other incidents uh, that you'd experienced with Mr. Alexander? Do you remember that? Yes. Related to other violent incidents? Yes. Okay. And one of the th things that came up is your response to these questions in whole was that this was different. He kept coming. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes. My question to you as it relates in comparison to these other incidents was the fear that you had on June 4th also different? It, yes, it was different in that it was, it wasn't just fear, it was mortal fear. Like, I thought I was going to die. Obera dropped camera people, come on. Get a life, Joe. Do you know one kills over a bleeding drop camera? Absolutely nobody believes that. And if you can, can you describe for us why you felt like you were going to die? It goes back to the choking incident and the fact that when he body slammed me and he was standing over me, again, I thought he was trying to get on top of me. And even when we fell, I felt he still was trying to get on top of me by grabbing at me. It's all bollocks, isn't it? It's all bollocks. You were also asked about shaking during the course of this trial. Do you recall being asked about that? I think that was this morning you were asked about that. Um, yes. Shaking all over. And you said that you were shaking during your cross-examination, I believe you said the first day, correct? Yeah, I think there were, tr I was shaking all the days, but most prominently on the first day of cross. Okay. Now, when you say shaking, what part of you was shaking? Um, my whole body trembles. Um, like, for example, when I wasn't talking, I had my, my jaw muscles hurt because I had my teeth clenched because my teeth would have been chattering so it was shaking that much. And sometimes I'll sit on my hands because I feel like they're shaking. And there were a few times when I wanted to reach for the water, but I knew that it would be visible and I'm, it's kind of embarrassing. I didn't want the state to know that, that he was affecting me that way. And so I just waited until I was... I felt like I could reach for the water without it make, making it obvious. So you attempted to hide the shaking from everyone in the courtroom? Yeah, I, I tense my whole body so that I'm not shaking. I just, I try to like have a physical control over it, <clears throat> although it's, sometimes it's difficult. This sensation of tensing your body so you didn't shake. Did you ever do that when Mr. Alexander was being physically violent with you? I don't recall attempting to stop it the way I, I try to now, but um, I don't know. Part of me wonders whether it's actually physically possible for her to be in that state, to shake, to be in kind of a state of anxiety? Because she's so used to putting others in a state of anxiety. How does she handle it herself? I don't think she's capable of shaking, to be honest. No. I mean, I think the only distress that she felt while she was on the stand with Juan was embarrassment and shame that her lies were being, you know, exposed, if you like. Yeah, and found out and caught out. Yeah. I think, you know, what we saw her distress on the stand was largely a show. Um, we've got to remember we're dealing with a psychopath here and we're dealing with a full-blown narcissist. Yeah, but since the cross, I haven't seen a shake. 
Any shaking she's been done has been for her, not because of any remorse or shame she felt for what she did to Travis and what she's doing to his family. Any tears are for herself, any shaking, which I've not seen a shake, and I doubt any of you have seen a shake, but any shaking is for herself. Don't think anyone has. No, it's just, as we said before, or as Timothy West just put it, all bollocks. <laughs> okay. One issue uh, that came up in a few of the questions a little bit yesterday and this morning uh, was the issue of shame. Do you recall discussing that? Yes. Which is an alien concept to her. Yeah, and I doubt she's ever felt it for anyone but herself. And I think you were asked something to the effect that, well, if you... It killed in self-defense, and maybe this is what you had done wrong. Uh, but there were some questions about shame as well in this regard. So I want to make sure we're clear. What are you ashamed of as it relates to June 4, 2008? I'm ashamed that that I did what I did. I'm ashamed that. I'm the person that that did that. Um, I, I was ashamed beyond beyond that. I was ashamed of some of the things that Travis and I did. Um, but more than shame, I was very horrified with myself. And is this where we're supposed to get the violins out and feel sorry for her? Because if it is, I must have missed something. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've only got the really smallest violin on earth. Yeah, me too. And I wouldn't even play it for her. No, I wouldn't. A crap bigger than you. I just never in my life imagined that I would be pushed to that point or capable of being pushed to that point or that that would be something that I would do because I... I was a person who loved all life and and this is kind of an, the extreme opposite. It, it would appear that way. I don't, I didn't feel that way, but it, it looks that way and I was very ashamed of it. Bitch, please. <laughs> Let me preface this by saying that, you know, you admitted throughout the course of your testimony uh, these, these past few weeks, you've admitted that you lied about uh, being there to Detective Flores, to, to the world, in essence, to some degree, right? Yes. And then when confronted with evidence, you lied uh, about your, your presence there. You lied to Detective Flores and, and ultimately on national TV by saying uh, the two intruders came in the home and uh, had caused Mr. Alexander's death. You recall doing that and admitting to lying about that? Yes. And you perpetrated that lie, as we've heard throughout this trial, for a long time. Isn't that correct? Throughout the trial? No, but throughout the case. No, throughout the case. Yes. Oh dear. I'm pathetic. Given all these lies, you were asked an important question. Why should anyone believe you now? Remember being asked that? Yes. So, Jody, that is the ultimate question. Why should anybody believe you now? After all the nonsense that she has spouted through that 
ugly mouth of hers through this trial. This is her elevator pitch now. This is the $64,000 question that she has to convince the jury now that she is telling them the truth after all the lies she has told. And the, I love it because she's just squirming now. Yeah, but she's going to have a hard time trying to convince the jury that what she's saying is the truth. Yeah. Um, we do know that one juror didn't go with the rest, didn't go with the flow, but most of that jury, I think, by now just knew that she did this with premeditation and malice aforethought, definitely. Yeah, that was not self-defence. So whatever she says now, short of divine intervention, she's not going to convince that jury. <laughs> no, she's not. Like I said before, all of my... I lied a lot in the beginning, and each of those lies tied back directly to two themes. Travis and protecting his ego. I mean, his reputation bit of a freudian slip there don't you think um and my own partially and to related to any involvement in his death so i understand that there will always be questions but all i can do at this point is say what happened to the best of my recollection and if i'm convicted then that's because of my own Bad choices Murder, in the beginning. And relevance and invades the province of the jury. Sustained. No further questions. Bye, have a great time. Yes, you may follow up. And there was much rejoicing. Ma'am, one of the things that you told us was that. Um, you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, throughout this proceeding. Do you remember that when you took the oath? Yes, to the best of my recollection. Um, am I asking you to the best of your recollection that you took the oath, ma'am? Oh, exactly. <laughs> and then they will fail. Objection, argument, judge. Sustained. Ma'am, do you remember standing in front of the clerk to Judge Stevens' left and being sworn in? Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember being asked, will you tell the truth, the whole truth? Do you remember being told that? Yes. And you swore that you would, right? Yes. One of the questions that was brought up during um, the questioning by the jury and also by your defense attorney involved your allegation involving Mr. Alexander's, or your claim of Mr. Alexander's alleged pedophilia. Do you remember that? That's correct. And this is the claim that you have alleged that it involved uh, January 21st of 2008, right? Yes. Whoa, right, okay, let's see where he goes with this. I'm gonna eat this up with a spoon and Yeah, let's you. face it, he's got a lot to work with, hasn't he? Yes. And you were asked by one of the jurors, well, ma'am, did you tell anybody else about this alleged claim of pedophilia? And you said, well, yeah, do you remember saying that you did? Yes. And do you remember that you kind of, at that point, hesitated and you turned to the jury and you said yes i did tell a psychologist right yes and you also indicated that you may have told somebody else right yes and with regard to these somebody else's who are they matt mccartney all right uh, and matt mccartney is this individual that is your friend right he is a friend of mine yes jesus is a friend of mine. i have a friend in jesus he's a person who will not betray you correct my confidence, yes. And he's somebody who, who, well, in the 48 hours interview, that's how you describe him. Someone who will not betray you, correct? Right, when I confide in him. Y yes or no? Yes. In the 48 hours interview that we saw, is it true that you said that he's an individual that will not betray you? That's correct. Additionally, didn't it also indicate that he's an ally? You indicated that he was an ally of yours, right? Yes. And this individual, Matt McCartney, is somebody who will also lie for you, won't he? No, he would never do that. Overall, he would never do that. Are you aware of the statements that he made in January of 2008? I'm sorry, in January of 2013, involving that very fact? Yes or no? Objection, Your Honor. Just get on the scope of the questions. Your approach. You may. Right, not too sure what happened there. Did Martinez just say that Matt McCartney went along with the intruders' story? 
or is this something else? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know what's happened. You might be thinking that you lied, maybe. I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, that's obviously what he's implying, but he, he's obviously got something up his sleeve. Let's carry on and see where he, where he goes with this. May I proceed? Uh, Matthew McCartney is this individual who is your ally, though, right? Was. Well, ask an answer. Stand. Now, you said that you would tell us the whole truth, right? Do you remember that you would say involving this pedophilia thing? Do you remember telling us yes. that? Yes. Well, you did tell us that you spoke to. Initially, you said, well, I did tell a therapist. Do you remember telling us that, right? Say what? Say what? Initially, you testified that you told a therapist, correct? He was not a therapist. Yeah. Okay. A psychologist. How about yes. that? Yes. Pedantic shit tea cake. Even though this... Can we approach? You may. Overruled. That's what I'm talking about! That's why he's there with me! And then you did make this statement to this psychologist. You told us about that earlier, right? Yes. Well... This is the one of the psychologists is Richard Samuels that you told, right? That was not the psychologist. Ma'am, I didn't ask you if that was one of the psychologists, did I? That's how I interpret it, so I guess not. I'm not asking you to interpret anything. If you don't understand the question, ask me, and we will repeat it for you. The question was, ma'am, do you understand that? Yes. With regard to this issue, isn't it true that one of the people that you told about this was Richard Samuels, correct? Yes. And this individual, Richard Samuels, is someone who is assisting in your defense, correct? Yes. And you also told Alice Laviolette, right? Yes. And these individuals, Alice Laviolette, for example, she's also going to testify on your behalf, correct? That's my understanding. Do you have any reason to believe that she's not going to testify on your behalf? Um, no. Then answer the question with a simple yes or no, you hog-nosed pisshead. Yeah, is she trying to act dumb again? She's dumber than everybody gives her credit for. She's interviewed you, right? Yes. And you've talked to her about this alleged pedophilia, correct? That's correct. And you told her what it was that you knew about the pedophilia, right? I don't remember how in-depth we discussed it, but I did tell her some you things did? about it. Yes. It's fair to say, for example, the statements that you made to Richard Samuels were made years after um, this case began to be prosecuted, correct? 63 tubes of KY jelly fed to the chocolate starfish later. Possibly, yes. I don't remember the exact time frame. Well, it was in 2011 that you talked to him about it, wasn't it? No, it was 2010 early. <laughs> Possibly, yes. I don't remember the exact time frame. Well, it was in 2011 that you talked to him about it, wasn't it? No, it was 2010 early. Oh, so I you believe. do remember that it was in 2010. So that was years after this case began to be prosecuted, right? <laughs> he got her there, didn't he? He got her there good. Fell, in, fell right into his trap there. Of course you did. I don't remember. No, it was 2010. Bloody hell. What a fraud. <laughs> Definitely a fraud. But if she can remember the time frame, then she can remember what, you know, everything else. Oh, my God. I tell you something. They may as well put a red nose, a curly wig, and, and like, clown makeup on her because that's what she's making herself look like. I believe it was, yes. Well, you just told me 2010. Are you going to go back on that or are you going to stay with that answer? Which one do you want? I'm, I think I'm trying to remember when I told him, but we began to meet, I think, within a year after. I'm not sure. So you speak to this individual. Isn't it to your benefit to start saying these kinds of things? I don't think so. I think it's mortifying. I am a Oh, so you think that it's to your detriment, then, to come in here and to court and talk about Mr. Alexander masturbating to a picture of a young person, a young girl, boy. Do you, you think that that's to your detriment? I don't know if it's my benefit or detriment. I just know it's the truth. 
Oh, hell no! I'm not asking you if it's the truth, am I? No. I'm asking you whether that's not, isn't that to your benefit? I don't know if it's to my benefit or my detriment. Why bring it up then if it isn't going to be of any use to you? I swear to tell everything that I remember. Pardon? I didn't hear you. Are you talking about here with Richard Sanders? I'm talking about right here. Why bring it up if it's not going to help you? Because it was asked. Oh, I see. So, now, so you are saying now that if it were up to you, you wouldn't have brought that up. How world? Um, I don't know. Jesus. Could this monster be any more despicable or any more devious? He's very bloody condescending, this bitch. Oh, not just condescending. I mean... Oh, God. That's one thing she is an expert on, I'll tell you. She must have read books on it because she's, she's an expert gaslighter. Unfortunately, if this was early in the trial, maybe she would have succeeded. But we're, we're too far in now. They've heard of her brutality. Yeah, the cat, she can't gaslight much longer. No, she can't. Um, it's starting to wear thin now. And Martinez is capitalising on that, and I hope he continues to. I'm sure he will. So, you didn't, even later after that, you spoke to Alice Laviolette about it, right? After Samuels? Sure. Um... It was after I first met Samuels, but I think their visits have been somewhat contemporaneous. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So you think that you met Alice Laviolette at the same time that you met Mr. Samuels? Is that correct? No, I said it. Testimony. Sustained. You did tell Alice Laviolette about this, right? Correct. And this was even years beyond the time that you talked to Mr. Samuels, correct? I don't know. It was after, but I don't know what years. And again, it was to your benefit because you're saying that you were a, you're saying that you're a victim of domestic violence to bring this up, right? I'm not saying it's to my benefit or detriment. It was asked of me. And um, you just went along and you did what you were told. Is that what you're saying? I argumentative, for speculation. World. I just answered questions. And so you're telling me that, yes, you did what you were told, kind of like with the interview with, um, first, with uh, first Edition or whatever it was. Inside Edition. Sustained. Did you, so you're saying that if it, just to be clear, are you saying that you would or would not have brought it up? It really depends on the time frame because I didn't want to ever bring it up and then well, oh, ma'am, we're talking about right now. Oh, I couldn't say. Pardon? Honestly, I, I really couldn't say. You couldn't say? No. It's not a memory issue, you just can't say, right? It's not really a preference or not a preference that I've explored or thought about in my mind. I'm just answering questions. The enthusiasm with which she brought up these you know, clearly false allegations about Travis were all, was almost tangible, palpable, wasn't it? Yeah, it was almost like she was getting off on it. Yeah. Um, let's face it. Jo it was the Jodie Arias show on the stand and behind the scenes she was running the show because she wants to be in control all the time. It's the narcissist in her, isn't it? Yeah, but unfortunately with, uh, with uh, Martina, she can't take over. No, she's, uh, she's met a match with him, but um, she just finds it very, very difficult to answer a simple yes or no questions. Not everything is a grey area, is it? No, it isn't. But immediately after it happened in January of 2008, you didn't tell anybody, right? Definitely not. And you were arrested on July 15th of 2008, and you didn't tell the detective, right? No. You had another conversation with the detective on July 16th of 2008, and you didn't tell him anything either, right, about this thing, right? That's correct. Um, you, whatever happened after that, you then say that you told somebody else, right? If Travis was genuinely into kids, and she had murdered him, and given that reason for murdering him, 
and it you know he was into it and there was evidence that he was into it then i don't think a single one of us would be talking about her like this would we no we wouldn't we'd be applauding her but there is no proof there is no evidence nobody has come forward to say um in the what since he died since he was killed what 14 years yeah nobody's come forward to say yes he abused me no parents have come forward to say yes he abused my son or my daughter nope and nobody but nobody has come forward with any proof that he was like this and they didn't find any evidence either Ab absolutely nothing right so if she was able to provide any evidence objective evidence that he was like this then maybe you know a lot of us would reconsider our opinion of her but as it stands no way you then stated as part of a question from the jury that you did tell somebody else right um yes but not in that order i understand that you remember the jury asking you a question about it and you kind of looked over the, at them and you said yes i did tell somebody else do you remember Tell him that. Yes. When was this that you told somebody else? April 2008. What was that again? April 2008. And who was it that you told in April of 2008 about this? Matt McCartney. So again, it's Mr. McCartney that you told. Besides Mr. McCartney. Oh, the other, the doctor? No. At, we were talking, let's do it this way. Do you remember we were talking about July 15th of 2008 in your arrest? Do you mean July 21st? You think you were arrested on July 21st of... Uh, I'm sorry, I was thinking you said January. July 15th, yes. Let's go back to the date of your arrest. You were arrested on July 15th of 2008, weren't you? Yes. And you had a conversation with the detective on that date, right? Yes. You were also had another conversation with the detective on July 16th of 2008, right? Yes. And... Detective Blaney, do you remember that? I remember that very well. Ever the ice queen with her, wasn't she? Yeah, but then again, it's because she was a woman. Yeah, no relatability. You didn't tell him anything about this, right? That's correct. You did say, though, when you were asked a question by the jurors about this, that after that, you did tell a psychologist about it. Do you remember answering that question to the jurors? Yes. When did you tell the psychologist about this issue involving the pedophilia? I think it was July 2009, I believe. And I'm not sure of the month, but it was 2009. You think it was July 2009? I'm not what entirely was the sure of the month. That you told to this to? Um, you may. You may proceed. So what was the day that you told this other individual for the first time about these allegations of pedophilia against Mr. Alexander? It wasn't the first time that I told somebody, but the individual you're referring to is, it was somewhere in 2009. I don't remember the exact month. It's difficult for you know which, to know which individual I'm referring to. Wouldn't you agree, ma'am? I know which guy. I just can't remember his name. He's a doctor out of San Diego. Okay. But the person before that that you told, according to you, is Matthew McCartney, right? That's correct. One of the things that we know, ma'am, is that you told us that, well, when you decided to take this trip, that you contacted Mr. Brewer because you wanted to take some, get some gas cans for him, right? Yes. It's been established that there were two gas cans each with the capacity of five gallons or a little bit over, right? That's my understanding. Well, you were there, right? Yes. And you filled them up in Pasadena, didn't you? It mischaracterizes her testimony. I'm sorry, three people talking at once. What is your objection? Objection, it mischaracterizes her testimony. She said never said five gallons or more. Overruled, you may proceed. Okay, you were the one that filled these cans up with gasoline in Pasadena according to you, right? I put gas in them. I don't know that I filled them to the brim because I was worried about their flammability. You, you were the one, though, that put the gasoline into these two gas cans, correct? Correct. Somebody on our last video commented 
um, on the smell that the gasoline would generate from her trunk or from her boot, whatever. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I would believe that because it is, you know, really, really pungent, isn't it? It is. It's very even when you're just driving behind a vehicle. You, when your windows are open, you can, yeah, smell it. Yeah. Well, at least it takes away the smell of her minge, doesn't it? <laughs> and you were the one that paid for them, right? Yes. And ma'am, you were the one that also put gas in your car, right? Yes. In response to a question from the jury, this issue was brought up as to what happened first or whether or not there were three cans. Do you remember three gas cans? Do you remember that line of questioning? How could I forget? Not the sequence, but the matter of three gas cans. Do you remember that this issue was brought up about whether or not you filled up your, can your car up with gas first or put the gas into the gas cans first? Do you remember even testifying about that I this remember morning? Testifying about you, that. Hold on, this morning. Do you remember testifying about that? Yes. And you indicated that, well, previously to that, that you didn't know which one had happened first, whether or not you'd put the, the gas into the car first or whether you'd put the gas into the cans first. Do you remember saying that you didn't know that, right? Um, are you talking about on cross? I'm talking about throughout these whole proceedings, ma'am. I remember on cross, I couldn't remember because the way you were questioning me. Well, ma'am, I'm not asking you about whether or not you remember anything on cross. I'm asking you whether or not previous to that, you told us that you couldn't remember if you put the gas, gasoline into the car first or into the cans first. Yes, I do remember that. Okay. But yet, when the jurors asked you the question, do you remember that you said, oh, I put the, the gas into the car first, and then I must have tripped or turned off the meter, if you will, and that's why there's these separate transactions. Do you remember telling us that? That was my only logic and understanding. And well, I I'm not asking about your logic and understanding. Isn't that what you told the jury just previously today? I did say that, but not in response to the question you're referring to. Ma'am, whether it's in response to the question I'm posing to you or not, isn't it true that that's what you told people, uh, the jurors here? Yes. So, so my question to you then, ma'am, is, isn't it true then that you do remember the sequence of events involving the filling up the car with gas in Pasadena? Is her testimony as to what she was filling up? The only part I remember, as far as sequence, is I put the gas in the gas cans, and then so I didn't leave the hose laying on the floor or the ground or the concrete, I hung it up. That ends the transaction. That's all I know. So you're saying now you're back to the, the issue of telling us that you don't remember whether or not you put gas in the car first or in the gas cans first, right? That's what you're saying. I really don't know the exact sequence. I wouldn't bet all my money on what it was. I can only go by receipts and times to help me remember. But that's so, you, so that's what you're saying, though, but you don't remember now. That's what you're telling us, right? From memory, no. That's what I'm asking you for. What, what is your memory of that event, right? Right? That's what I'm asking you, right? Okay. And with regard to that time, nobody was yelling at you at that time, right? That's correct. Nobody was grilling you, right? That's correct. You've been fond of telling us how great of a memory you have if no one is yelling at you, right? Yes. But that's something that you just don't remember, though, right? Uh, not in great detail. That's right. But, but you did tell us that you do have a very good memory for detail previously, though, right? Usually, yes. There were a thousand places we could have interrupted that with commentary, but we just thought we'd let it flow because it was compelling, wasn't it? Yeah, but she's just getting really on my nerves now. When she was, you know, nitpicking, you visibly yelled out, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and I can understand, but to me, I had the opposite effect. It made me smile because it just shows you she was flailing. She was desperate. She was trying to come up with anything. But one just caught her in a lie. One just caught her saying, first she didn't know, then she did. And now she's saying again she doesn't, right? Her credibility is having huge shotgun blasts put through them at the moment by Juan Martinez. And it's just, it's so good to watch after all the gaslighting. Yeah, it is good to watch him pull, pull her eyes down, but gosh. 
I know. The way she just da- dances around the question. Yeah. And tries to fit it into another date that suits her. And then you've got Nermi. Whenever Juan even dares to challenge any of her lies, he pipes up, mischaracterizes a testimony. He's challenging the testimony that she gave. He's not mischaracterizing it. He's challenging it. There's a bloody big difference. Yeah, but the judge knows that, and that's why she's sustaining or overruling it yeah mostly when he's been giving that you know reason for his objection she's been overruling it and she's quite right to yeah because martinez is quite entitled to challenge her testimony without him piping up that he's mischaracterizing it and he's not uh ma'am the other thing that you told us with regard to these gas cans is that you purchased one in salinas california right yes five gallon gas can right yes and you purchased this uh gas can in Salinas and you said after a short period of time well you didn't say a period of time but you said that you returned it back to the store in in the Walmart in Salinas right that's correct and it's the same store that you brought it from right yes because it was in the probably because it was in the same general vicinity right right and ma'am one of the other things that you said was that the reason that you did this was because you it was expensive and it didn't seem to make sense to you to get that gas can, right? Yeah, in hindsight, I realized it didn't make sense. I'll tell you something. If you ever gave Joe Diarius an air exam, you'd see daylight. I mean, we all know that she bought the gas can and kept it. There's an, she didn't fetch it back. But even if she did, why, well, why buy it in the first place? You know, how yeah. bloody stupid. You would think that she would have realised if she if she needed it or not after she filled up the other two gas cans. Yeah, you 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 would think that she has intelligence enough to th- say think you know know that one and one is two and two and two is four and four and four is eight etc. To at least do some basic arithmetic, but no. But fortunately, if there was any sort of documentation from Walmart to support her claim that she took the gas can back then yes maybe you know we could take her at a word but there's nothing there and everything then would have been computerized yeah exactly even back then hell when i worked for tesco in the 90s that was all computerized every single transaction was was computerized so she is full of pooties once again yeah she is all right so why is it then are you why is it then, ma'am, that you showed up with three gas cans in Salt Lake City? Objection, Ms. Kerr, the testimony. All right. And also the questions as well. Approach, please. Let me proceed. So why is it that you had uh, three gas cans in Salt Lake City, ma'am? I don't even recall going to Salt Lake City. I went to West Jordan, and I went so you, to. So oh, you hold on. You, you you're, first, let's break that down. You're saying you don't ever even remember going to Salt Lake City ever on June sixth of two thousand and eight. I don't recall where the city limits end and begin. Slimy heifer. But to answer the gas can question, I went to Mesa with two gas cans. Well, you did go to Salt Lake City, right? I was in the vicinity. I went to Sandy, I think, and West Jordan. You did visit an individual by the name of Ryan Burns, right? That's correct. And during that time, before you left Salt Lake City, you left Salt Lake City area in the very early morning hours, right? Yes. You filled up with gas, right? I think I did. I don't know. Well, let's look. Let's start looking at this. Whoa, what, what, what's he doing here? Maybe he's got something else maybe he's, he's going to hit her with. Maybe, maybe he's got something up his sleeve, let's say. And in fact, ma'am, we'll take a look at exhibit 237.017. You see L- SLC? Yes. You don't have any doubt that that stands for Salt Lake City, Utah, does it? No, I don't doubt that. And that's Tesoro, right? That's a gas station, right? Yes. And you fill, you put some gasoline there, right? Yes. 
we look down here, it does have your name on there, right? Yes. Then if we look at exhibit 237.016, there's Salt Lake City, right? Yes. And does you see your name right there? Yes. So you were in Salt Lake City, first of all, to establish that, right? Okay, yes. And you were there in the early morning hours, right? I left Ryan's house in the early morning hours, so. Well, that's so we can just make sure that we have the time. 237.016. See the time there? Yes. What time does it indicate that you're putting gas in the car, right? Yes, 3.57. This woman does not sleep. No, she must be a vampire. Yeah, I was just going to say Bobby taught her how to hang upside down, probably. Right, and it does tell us here that you went to pump number two, right? Yes. Put in 10.672 gallons, right? Yes. And the price for each one was 3.85 per gallon, right? Yes. And it was $41.18, right? Yes. Then at two, exhibit 237.017, same gas station, you see that? Yes. You see the date and the approval time? Yes. It's 4.05 in the morning, correct? Correct. And on this one, it's 36.98, right? Yes. And it talks about that you're at pump two again, and it's 9.583 gallons, right? That's correct. You actually put in more gas, though, didn't you? I don't know. Well, then let's take a look at the... You had a bank account with Washington Mutual, didn't you? Yes, I did. And in fact, we have some receipts here to talk about you having an account with Washington Mutual. And in fact, you had two of them, right? Yes, a business and a personal. 237.005, you see that? Yes. There's an account, there's a deposit, that's your account, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just beyond the scope of the questions. Overruled. Right? That's my account. And then you also had another account, 237.006, and we've talked about this exhibit, right, before? Um, yeah, I think so. Washington Mutual account, right? Yes. And there are records that Washington Mutual keeps, don't they? Yes. You aware of that? Yes. And there are statements that they send out to you, don't they? Um, I think I got them online, usually. But there are statements that are prepared, whether they are yes. online or they're sent out, right? That's correct. So I had to take a look at an exhibit. Take a look at exhibit number. 523, and after you look at it, see if that refreshes your, or whether or not you recognize that as your statement from Washington Mutual. Um, yes, it does look like that. And what's the time period, ma'am? It should say on the upper right-hand corner. It says June 1st through June 30th. All right. I may have it back. Move for the admission of Exhibit 523. We're going to object to our number. We approach. You may. 523 is admitted. I am invincible! Let's take a look at Exhibit 523. That's your parents' home, correct? No, that's my grandparents' home. That's your grandparents' home. And that's where you were living, right? Yes. On page two, there are three transactions that I want to focus into Tesoro. And Tesoro is the, on 237.016, that's the merchant. You see that? Yes. 237.017, that's also Tesoro. Do you see that? 237, what did you say? Tesoro. Do you see that at the very top? Oh, yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. And so when we're talking about this exhibit, do you see three transactions to Tesoro in Salt Lake City, Utah, correct? Yes, I do. Whoa, there's another transaction. Same, same service station. Oh, Jesus. I don't think that was mentioned. Oh. You were in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 6th 
of 2008, weren't you? Yes. You just told me that you were leaving there in the morning, that area, to come back to Wairika, right? That's correct. You told us previously that you were going to come back so that you could go back to work, right? Yes. And if you take a look at this purchase here from Tesoro, you see the amount there? Yes. How much is that, ma'am? $36.98. Okay. Let's take a look at exhibit number 237.017. How much is the amount? $36.98. It's the same station, it's the same amount, correct? Correct. That's the same purchase, right? Yes. And exhibit number 237.016, it's, it's for how much, ma'am? Forty-one eighteen. And if we go down here, do you see that right there? Yes. How much is that? Forty-one eighteen. That's the same amount, right? Correct. And then you do have, though, a third transaction there. Do you see that? Yes. Nineteen sixty-five, right? Yes. Ma'am, if we go back to exhibit number two thirty-seven point zero one seven. So we've just done a little bit bit of adding up, haven't we? Yeah, we have. And we may be preempting uh, Juan Martinez here, but we calculate that she has actually filled up a car plus put gas in all three gas cans. Um, she must have done. In those transactions. We broke she... it down for in gallons, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We even added it up. Yeah. So she not only filled up the car, she filled up all three gas cans as well. So... If we are preempting him, we're sorry, but we were just curious. Yeah, very. With, with those three transactions. How much was the price per gallon that you bought that day? Um, it looks like three eighty-five. And nine tenths, right? Yes. Ma'am, if you take this amount per gallon. Three eight five nine. Three point eight five nine. Three dollars point eight five nine cents per gallon. And you divide it into this amount of nineteen sixty five. Do you know how much how, what, what what that division would indicate? No. Would it be surprise you that it would indicate that it's five point zero nine? Would that surprise you? Surprise, mother. Mm -hmm. Um, no. So, you make three purchases here, don't you? Yes. You also, there are two purchases for sure that we know that are for gas, right? That's correct. The other one is for 1965, right? Yes. If we do the mathematics, that equals five gallons of gas. Objection. If you if you were putting gas. Objection, argumentative is set. There's no testimony that it was gas purchased. Overruled. Damn right to. What was your question? The, the question is a mathematical one, ma'am. Isn't it true that if you divide 1965 by 3.859 that you would get 5.09? If the math is correct, then yes. And you did indicate to us that you did buy a third can in Salinas, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you bought that in Salinas, and it was a five-gallon gas can, right? That's correct. Ma'am, would it surprise you that the Walmart in Salinas does not have any record of any refund back on June 2nd when you claim you bought this, or June 3rd when you claim you bought this, Objection. of a refund? Objection. beyond the scope. Approach, please. May continue. Yeah. Exhibit number 237.008. Walmart receipt. You see this, correct? Yes. This is the Walmart that you went to in Salinas and you purchased a five gallon gas can, right? You told us that before, right? Yes, I did. And you were there on June 3rd of 2008 at 3.22 in the afternoon when you made that purchase, right? That's correct. Would it surprise you to find that on that, per and you said that you got a refund in cash, didn't you? Yes, I did. Would it surprise you that Walmart does not have any record of any refund for a gas can on that date of June 3rd of 2008? 
Considering that I returned it, that would surprise me. Pardon? Considering that I returned it, that would surprise me. It would surprise you? Yes. Because you claim you returned it on that day, right? Yes, I did, and I received cash for it. Pardon? And I received and cash for it. And you received cash, okay. You also told us that you received an injury to your right finger at Casa Ramos. Do you remember that? Approach, please. You may continue. Do you remember in response to a question from the jurors that you said that you damaged your right finger during a glass breaking incident at Casa Ramos. Do you remember telling us that? It was not glass breaking. I jammed it on a metal ledge. All right. At so Casa at Ramos. Casa Ramos, you injured your finger, right? Yes. And do you remember that you told us, well, no paperwork was filled out, right? That's correct. And you told us that no paperwork was filled out was because this was a really small business, right? Um, I said it was a, did I say a small business? It's just a private business, yeah. Well, no, pri most businesses are private. Are, are you saying now that, that you meant to, to say it was a private business? Is that what you're saying? No, it was a small business. There were only like maybe four or five restaurants. So you, you think that four or five restaurants are a small business, right? Usually I work for chains that have thousands of restaurants, so that's a very small business. Yes. So to you, this is a small business because you believe that there are only four, re four, bis four locations, right? There may have even been less then. I don't know. I think there were very few in the Northern California area. And just because they're a small business, they do not have to comply with reporting accidents on the job, is what you're telling us, right? Objection, cause speculation, relevancy. Sustain to that question. Ma'am, actually, don't they actually have, back then, didn't they actually have 13 restaurants? Objection, cause speculation, ask and answer. Overlooked. Um, not that particular franchise. They only had a few. I know that I, my understanding is that it's a family of two brothers or cousins. They're related somehow and that they own a chain of a different type of restaurant in Oregon. And then the restaurants I worked for, there was just a few of them. So you're saying that the, there may be two restaurants then that are called Casa Rome, right? <laughs> no, not two. There were more than two, but there weren't very many. No, what you're saying is that, the, that there's that you're drawing now a distinction between the ownership of the Casa Ramos restaurants, one being owned by one member of the family and one being owned by another member of the family, right? Objection, relevance, argument, way beyond the scope of any of the questions. Have a Nermi objecting on the grounds of relevance is a bit rich, don't you think? Yeah, considering what he was bleeding, questioning her about. Yeah, must be so disappointed that one's clearly swerving the sex issues. <laughs> yeah. Which is too right as well. The other restaurants are called Azteca, so yeah, they're completely different. All right, so when we talk about Casa Ramos, we're actually just talking about on the marquee Casa Ramos, and your, your belief is there's only approximately four of those, right? I only knew of four or five. And because of their size, you told us, or you, in response to a jury question, that even though you suffered this injury, well, you did tell the manager about the injury, didn't you? I had to get a Band-Aid, yes. Well, you did tell the manager about the injury. Didn't you tell us that? Yes. And you did take a picture of that injury, right? Yes. And we've seen that picture of that injury, right? Yes. And you're saying that because of the type of business that it was, no claim had to be filed pursuant to the laws of, of the state of California, right? That's not what I'm saying. I said that that was my speculation as to why nothing was ever filled out. You didn't fill anything out, right? No, I didn't. The manager didn't fill anything out, even though you told him about it, right? Objection caused speculation. Sustained. You, you did talk to the manager about it, correct? Not in great depth. I asked him for a band-aid. I'm band -aid. not asking you in great depth. Yes or no, did you talk to the manager? I asked him for a band-aid. So are you now saying that you didn't tell the manager that you hurt yourself on the job? Is that what you're now telling us? I'm not sure what was said, I just know I needed a band-aid quick because it was busy and I was about to bleed a lot. When we made our original point about the accident book, I knew this had to be documented somehow. You have to be, I mean, the, the, the culture of, you know, 
suing people in America, especially when after accidents, you know, it, it's huge. So they have to protect themselves. It seems absolutely mind-boggling to me that the owners of Casa Ramos didn't have some sort of documentation um, procedure in place if someone had an accident there, a, a member of staff or a customer. Yeah, because it does have to be documented in case it's serious and in case you need to go to the hospital. I mean, there is such a thing called liability insurance and not it doesn't just cover the customers, it covers staff and anybody working on site at the time. Yeah. And every single business has to have liability insurance. I don't care what country you live in. So, you know, as part of the liability insurance, you have to keep documentation and... Just asking your employer for a Band-Aid, your employer's going to say, why do you need a Band-Aid? And they would have to get it documented. Which, to me, says this didn't happen. So it appears from what you're telling us now is that you never indicated to him that you were injured on the job, then, as you previously told us. Well, asking for a Band-Aid is an indication that I'm injured. Pardon? Asking for a Band-Aid, to me, is an indication that I've, I'm injured. No, but what I'm saying is specifically... Previously, on your examination, you indicated that you did talk to the manager about your injury. Do you remember telling us that? Yes. And during that conversation, you said that he knew that you had injured yourself at work. Do you remember telling us that? I don't know what he knew. I just know that he knew I asked him for a band-aid. So, so now you never told him about you being injured on the job. You just for, asked for a band-aid then, right? Yes, and I was holding my hand, putting pressure on it. Well, so now you're changing your story. And you were holding your hand, putting pressure on it, and you're saying he didn't ask you anything about how you injured your hand at all, right? Objection calls for hearsay. Overruled. I only remember that we were very busy in the middle of the rush, and we didn't have time to sit and discuss my hand. I, I'm not asking you if you were busy. I'm asking you whether or isn't it true that he did not ask you, according to your statement, anything about how you'd, you'd suffered that injury? That, according to my statement, what you're saying is not true, or it might be true, but I don't remember what was discussed regarding the injury. All I know is I hurt my hand, it, the skin folded back, I flipped it over, put pressure on it, and said I, need, I went and found my manager, said I need a Band-Aid right away. There were tons of tickets coming through, I had a bazillion margaritas to make, and it was busy, and I needed a Band-Aid. That's all I know. So you did not cut yourself on a margarita glass, though, right? No, I didn't cut myself on glass, it was a jam from right. metal. No, previously, do you remember telling us in response to a jury question that you had cut yourself on a margarita glass? glass. Overruled. Give me answer. I didn't say margarita glass in reference to Casa Ramos. I cut my hand on a glass at Travis's house. I'm talking about Casa Ramos. I'm not talking about Mr. Alexander's house. I'm talking about Casa Ramos. You're saying that you injured your finger, your right ring finger, on something other than glass, correct? Yes. We're positive she said glass. She did say glass. She said she was a klutz and that she had to gather it all up. Do you remember? I remember and she and she cut her finger on it. Yeah, and she was she broke it and as she was gathering it up, she cut her finger and she was scared of gathering any more up. That's what I remember. She is definitely changed. She's getting desperate. Of course she is, because she knows she's been caught out. Yeah, she probably looks very cool, calm and collected, but trust me, inside she is panicking. <laughs> and you didn't tell the manager about the way this occurred, even though it occurred while on the job, right? I don't recall if it was discussed in detail or not. And you're the same person that previously testified today that you have a very good memory for details, right? Yes. Except for then. You don't remember that one, right? I didn't say it was perfect. I said it was good. No, I'm not saying that you said it was perfect. You, you yourself admitted that you had a good memory for details, right? Objection, argumentative estimate. Overruled. I don't even know that I used details. I just said I think I have a good memory. Judge, I'm done with this area. All right. Ladies and gentlemen. No court tomorrow, Friday. No court Monday or Tuesday, the 11th and 12th. So we'll see you back here on the 13th at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on the 13th. Between now and then, remember the admonition. Are there any questions? We'll see you next Wednesday. You are excused.
serious. You may step down. Thank you. Council, anything else? No. We are at recess. Another fairly eventful day of uh, of testimony. Yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, those jury questions were absolutely brilliant, weren't they? I mean, you know, like we said, they've asked a lot of questions that we asked, a lot of questions that you have asked, um, and a lot of questions that, well, I can't remember anybody asking. Well, all I can say is that jury's definitely on the ball. Yeah, they, they've got their head screwed on. And, of course, you know, we knew that... Bless Nermy, you know, we've got nothing against him, but he had to go back and just, pardon the uh, pun here, but probe around the sex questions, didn't he? God, I, I think we've covered that bleeding topic more than enough. I mean, I understand his need to be thorough, but there's overkill, isn't there? And that was definitely overkill. Yeah. And then, you know, when he ceded the um, mic to Martinez, I couldn't believe... One thing that struck me when, you know, we were watching Martinez, you know, have a go at her, he was furious. Don't you think? Yeah, you could see it. You could see he was furious. I mean, you know, he's been pretty furious when he's, you know, talked to her before. But on this particular occasion, he was barely holding it back. He was, you know, he was livid with her. And, and it, it was, you could tell. I could tell anyway. And you know what? I didn't see a shake once. No, I didn't. Not once. And she deserved every single bit of ire that, you know, he threw at her. Of course so, she did. She deserved everything. Yeah, so that was rather sweet to watch. So, next episode will be part 34 and will be day 30 of the trial. So, that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, um, I can't wait for that one. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you so much, everybody, for staying with us till the end. We really do appreciate it. Um, if you've not dropped a like on this yet, please do. If you've not subscribed to us yet, please do. Um, also join our Macclesfield mob three pound a month you get early access to our videos you get exclusive live streams all sorts of lovely things don't they yes you do if you stick around till the end you'll see um, our members in there an absolutely lovely bunch aren't they oh yeah yeah they're great our mob is. love them to bits um, but thank you so much everyone we shall see you hopefully next Saturday for part 34 bloody hell um, take care look after yourselves as we always say one, One love from, from Macclesfield. Macclesfield. Bye. Bye.